public, and you are welcome to join us in person or by watching from the Council's agenda page, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whichever manner you feel most comfortable. This is a work session meeting during which there's no public comment. Please join us tonight during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. We, of course, welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah. 84114-5476 by email at council.comments at slcgov.com or via our 24-hour phone comment line 801-535-7654. Comments we receive on agenda topics are shared with council members and posted to our website at slccouncil.com. We'll now begin our work session. The first agenda item is informational updates from the administration. I see Ashley Cleveland is here. Andrew, oh, I see Andrew over there. Come on up. Good afternoon, Council. So good to see you so soon and happy day after uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So fun volunteering with you yesterday. Um, our highlights this go round will mostly focus on ongoing um, civic engagement opportunities. Um, as always, everyone online, please do tuning in online, please do figure, please do visit the slc.gov forward slash feedback um, forward slash website. Um, it's regularly updated with highlighted ways to engage with the city. One thing I would really like to um, bring up from the community outreach team's perspective is there are not a lot of city, uh, there, are a lot of, uh, there are not a lot of in-person civic engagement opportunities happening until spring um, ramps back up, but that doesn't mean that there still aren't a lot of opportunities to provide feedback and comment while we get ready for the spring season. So I spent some time going through the civic engagement website and I wanted to highlight all of the opportunities that are available and the different ways you can engage with them. So the Reimagine Donner Trail Park, they have a full web page and engagement report. Their engagement closed over the fall. So if anyone wants to know how um, well it did and who we were able to talk to, please feel free to dig into the engagement report and reach out to our civic engagement um, team with more questions. We also have the Reimagine Liberty Park Playground. They have a full web page, upcoming event updates for you to sign up for, and a full engagement report as well. The Connect SLC Citywide Transportation Plan has a full web page, a draft plan that is complete and ready for all citizens review, and a comment form that's available in English and Spanish, which I think is really great. We have our Livable Streets survey. It's fully functioning and available, so please give us your feedback. We also have our accessibility um, in all of our parks being put on by our ADA coordinator from the mayor's office. That survey is still ongoing and open. And then we also have the Allen Parks concept survey where we are welcome to review all the concepts that the community has decided upon. Those are still open. Furthermore, we have the Making the Emerald Ribbon. There is a full story map, which is really engaging, where you can actually upload your own um, story on their sharing platform. And of course, the Fleet Block Art Healing Comment Form is still available with a full web page um, that consists of all the history regarding Fleet Block, the most recent council decision, and a comment form, form available on the heart, art healing process. So we would love to hear from you on that. Um, Capitol Hill has a traffic calming web page available that should be really interesting considering that um, construction should be starting and engagement um, closed in october for that and then we also have our landscaping and buffers chapters amendment and a full web page is available there so if you just want more information on even what landscaping and buffers are how do we define changing that amendment please do visit it and then one of my favorites is the Fighting the Freight Train Crisis. There is a web page and story sharing form in English and Spanish. And I'm pretty so sure Puhi would love to um, invite people to provide some stories there. Now, um, from the mayor's office, as we get ready for Black History Month um, and Sorry, also a series. Sorry, I can't get my microphone to work. 
Ah, there it goes. My headphones, I mean. Maybe cool. it went? Who's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so to kick off our series that we call the annual community meeting series in February um, next year, I mean this year, we will start with our um, Black History Month engagement. So we have a series called the annual community meeting series. Um, what are they? They're general community meetings occurring around cultural heritage, history, months, or days. They are extremely similar to our existing community council quarterly meetings where we invite our community council chairs and co-chairs to meet with the mayor's office and staff. Um, we uphold a community created theme with our collaborators. Uh, we send out a survey to guide the overall discussion with community members. We include city staff from various divisions and we can include a proclamation reading, although it is not required because we want to make sure we're more accessible and can have those meetings available in the evening. And council is always welcome to join us as usual. Um, these meetings hopefully result in better connection in various ways. Um, <clears throat> As pictured here last year, we had the Black and African American Leader Service. It was hosted at Calvary Baptist Church. And this year, the title will be uh, the Black Diaspora Annual Community Meeting with Community Outreach. Um, the Mayor's Office Community Outreach Team has hosted this inclusion-focused event to build the relationship with city officials and staff. It is one of eight annual connections to minoritized communities. The goal is to have tough conversations and connect communities, their leaders, business owners, residents, artists, and activists to staff to fill any gaps when in service when it's possible. A lot of the goals um, that we really try to connect community members to is, of course, our weekly community outreach newsletter. Please uh, visit our website and sign up for it. We also have community office hours that are regularly updated there, and we will have a new way to be doing promotion uh, a month prior to those. So you guys should be getting updates about those more regularly. And then, of course, we have 29 boards and commissions representing over 280 resident consultants and partners citywide. And so we usually try and let the community know about openings there um, so that they can be they can feel included to apply. As a community outreach team, we recognize that not all of our um, community councils officially recognize organizations and board commissions reflect all of our city. And as mayor's office staff, we want to play a positive role in getting people excited about working with this administration. We need minoritized community groups and leaders of those groups to share civic opportunities that shape their neighborhoods so that we can better serve. Engagement isn't about agreement, but it's rather about involvement. And there are some pictures with some of community members that we have hosted this meeting series with over the past year. Thank you. Hello, council members. Andrew Johnston from uh, the mayor's office as well. This slide is up. Again, uh, high utilization of the existing uh, homeless resource centers and the winter overflow beds. The code blue beds are still being used. We've had a number of code blue nights last week, another one tonight. After tonight, uh, we anticipate that the weather will be a little more mild than it has been, so we may not have more opportunities um, in the next week necessarily. The encampment and impact mitigation work is still um, sparse, I'll say that. Um, the, rash, the reason is the code blue situation and the storms coming through. However, there is still cleaning going on and we can do some work on a case by case basis. So most likely that may look like um, an area of uh, more sensitivity around a school, a daycare, those kind of things. If there's a camp that's causing disruption there, we may have to do some action, um, but we're trying to avoid this as much as we can. Um, just for your knowledge. And the next resource, their last resource fair went really well at the Miller uh, Resource Center, and they're planning another one for fe February 9th. I uh, don't know the location of that yet. We'll get that to you as soon as possible. Next slide. The updates here in Sandy, the Medically Vulnerable Persons Program is opening next week. They got their certificate of occupancy and their license. Uh, they'll be ramping up on a daily basis as they go forward. Uh, I don't anticipate them being to 165 very shortly. They're still doing some renovations as they go along, but they'll be up over 100, I think, pretty quickly, which is a good sign for all of us. Uh, point in time count is on the 25th. 
uh, 26th and 27th. We still need volunteers for the county. Uh, that means anybody, no experience necessary, just a willingness to get up fairly early, at least one one morning, and go out and help. Uh, so get online at the Salt Lake Valley Coalition and Homelessness website. You can see that in yellow on the left, and they'll have a link right there. You can sign right up for it. Similar thing with Code Blue shelters. We still need volunteers for these other um, locations uh, tonight, particularly. So the Second and Second Coalition and the Valley Behavioral Health location uh, both need volunteers, and they will be open tonight again. Like I said, volunteers are needed. They can sign up again at the Salt Lake Valley Coalition and Homelessness website. There's a link right there. It's very simple. No experience necessary. Just a willingness to try, and they'll train and help you along. So. Uh, don't be too scared about these opportunities. The last slide is just a follow-up from last week. There were a number of questions that were emailed, responses were emailed to the council uh, office. And if there are questions, we can do that here, or if not, we can move on. It's not, a, not an issue. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Andrew. Council members, any questions, concerns? All right, you guys got off easy today. Thank you. All right, next up, we will hear about an ordinance to rezone at 2260, 2270, and 2290 East, 1300 South. We've got Brian Fulmer from the Council Policy Analyst coming up with the Dream Team from Planning, Chrissy Gilmore and Kelsey Lindquist. Oh, you're just sending, you're just sending Kelsey by yourself. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> oh, your name was not in here. I was totally unprepared for this. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a proposal amending the zoning map properties you referenced in Council District 6 from their current R17000 or single family residential zoning to CB or community business. No development plans have been submitted at this point, but it is anticipated the properties will be developed along with adjoining property to the south for multifamily or mixed use. The petitioner is planning to join us online and would appreciate an opportunity to address the council. Now I'll turn it over to Eric. Okay, next slide. So this gives you an idea of the area here and just above, just east of Foothill Drive um, and 13th South. And it's, so it's those three residential properties uh, shown there. The properties are currently used as uh, single family homes, but they're rentals. And uh, the petitioner owns the properties immediately to the south and would like to eventually combine those and have one development where the parking lot sits now and the homes are. Um, next slide. So this also gives you an idea of the context and the surrounding zones. Uh, with open space where the um, cemetery is to the east and then the R1-12000 neighborhood to the north and surrounding CB zone uh, where the commercial properties are. And there's a picture of those three homes. Next slide. And again, that's just to give you a little bit of context on the properties in the surrounding area. Next slide. So uh, in looking at this, uh, planning staff's recommending approval for the rezone and um, just kind of an idea of what would change. Uh, of course, the permitted use is going from the single family. This would allow for um, medium density mixed use and residential uh, properties. But the CB is a zone that's designed to be compatible with uh, it, a transitional zone from single family residential to commercial. So we felt that that was appropriate. The height doesn't change much, just going to 30 feet from the 28. And uh, there are reduced setbacks, but they're appropriate uh, for commercial scale development. And it does include um, certain provisions. There's one, there's more design standards in that that are um, that the property would be subject to uh, ensuring a good transition to the neighborhood, but also if any building is over 7,500 square feet and uh, that it would need to go to the design review and would be subject to additional standards that would be reviewed by the planning commission. Next slide. 
And we felt it was appropriate given the various master plans, Plan Salt Lake and the uh, East Bench master plan, that it would help accomplish uh, various initiatives um, that are listed there, but also uh, providing for additional housing that's uh, maybe not as available on the east side and in this area, uh, but that it was an appropriate scale um, in transitioning from the single family to the existing commercial. Uh, next slide. I think that's it. Yeah. So um, if you have any questions or um, again, the applicant is, has joined us online, I believe, and should be able to go over some things. So. Thank you, Council. Any questions for staff? Yes, Matt here. Uh, first question on the these sing, three single family zones. Uh, there's zero setback for the commercial CB on that, but is it required to have a front facing access off of 13 South? Uh, whether walking in, they don't have necessarily have to have a driveway, but maybe walking into a store. Yeah, yeah. So there would be entrance requirements facing the public street, both public streets, 13 and 23rd. Correct. Okay. Uh, the next uh, question on just the the rest of the area is CB is the rest of the I'm gonna say triangle uh, mm -hmm. up to the hotel is that all owned by the same property owner? You know, not not all of it is. Um, the developer, I believe, controls the um, just the commercial property. I don't know that they have the hotel. I think they just have where the restaurant slash the form, office the former, is that's, that's the, vacant currently. Okay, that one. And then when the planning commission looked at this, uh, it was a discussions on. Uh, we recently passed the affordable housing initiative, which mm -hmm. basically gave us uh, or developer and the neighborhood the the opportunity to take a single family home up to a fourplex with the incentive of affordable housing. Was that ever discussed at the Planning Commission or was that ever discussed with the developer? Um, that wasn't uh, just one, it wasn't passed by then uh, when this was submitted. Okay. Um, I'm sure they could possibly speak more to that. That's not something we've entirely examined. We can, we can certainly look into that and, and give them more of an idea of what would now be available. but. We haven't. Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm open and I very, I'm, I'm a, I would love to see community development on this side of, the, uh, of Foothill because there's really very little over there. And it'd be nice to have a, an additional restaurant. I used to walk to that. There used to be a Red Robin there when Sarah was gone and I had to fend for myself. <laughs> I would go down there for a burger and a beer. Uh, it was an easy walk for me and maybe, yes. And it was nice to have. Uh, and I'd love to have another restaurant there or a coffee shop or a small local local community stores because that's that's what we're asking for is these community nodes. But I also understand the uh, that these are three single family homes that we just said, hey, we can also develop with affordable housing tacked onto it without anything uh, you know uh, at the benefit of the the community and the neighborhood. So uh, I'm just looking at this going, is there a need to change this zoning to CB when we can have affordable housing on these three, three uh, parcels. And, uh, and that's up to the rest of the uh, property owner, but uh, he has an incentive to give us affordable housing. Because right now, is there, was there any discussion about affordable housing on changing this rezone with the property owner? Um, again, that, so that's something, um, you know, we're, we kind of go with the, the petition we've been or the request that we're given and so um you know we talked about what's available in the zone but uh, we didn't have the affordable housing in place so we can certainly educate them on that and help them understand it now that it's available um my understanding is again they're interested in taking over like that parking lot area and making something that would you know have a, additional units and things like that, but I, I, that hasn't necessarily been decided upon is, is my understanding. Maybe the applicant can fill us in on that more, but, um, you know, we just kind of look at is the, is the request appropriate, right. For, you know, what the area, right. I mean, I, I love that. I want to get rid of the parking lot. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I hate parking lots like that. I mean, that's just black asphalt. It's not great. I love to have, uh, the trees in, in, uh, 
and the community know they're without a big parking lot. So, but I'm just looking at these two different CV zones. We have three parcels, uh, and I'd like to make sure that we have affordable housing, and that's why we did the affordable the affordable housing initiative, yeah. and how that in, plays in, uh, with this uh, this current development and their ideas. Council, uh, any other questions for staff? Because it sounds like we're at a pretty good moment to give the developer, the owner, a chance to speak. All right. Mr. Morris, thank you for joining us. Typically, we give uh, landowners and petitioners five minutes to explain anything. You do not have to take that time. Uh, but yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. Yeah, can, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Sorry for not being there at conflicting meetings but to, to Zoom in like this, but I appreciate the time. Um, I represent uh, Jim Duffin, who's who's also on. He owns uh, these three homes, the, the parking lot to the south, and what used to be the Red Robin, uh, and I believe Marie Callender's before that is uh, what I was corrected last time. Um, uh, not the gas station, uh, and then not the not the hotel. Uh, the concept from from our end, uh, as Eric described, is to to take these three. Uh, merge them into effectively a, a, a broader development with the parking lot to the south and uh, retain the restaurant that's there. I think Jim's already in the process of of putting a new tenant in the restaurant that's on Foothill. Uh, so so that would remain kind of a retail option there. And then, you know, most likely what we've considered as, as an apartment complex up to the east that would that would take over the bulk of the parking lot and the bulk of the kind of eastern portion of, of these homes. And then you would have, um, you know, auto access from Foothill and from from 13th South. You know, the scale of, of that apartment would be pretty similar to that, you know, Hampton Inn that's, that's just to the south. It's based on height requirements. You would probably end up with kind of 50 to 60 apartments in, in that area is, is kind of what we ballparked. But we've just looked at it loosely from there. Um, you know, the, as, as mentioned, the, the homes in their current location with the zoning that's around them, they're, they're a bit of an odd fit and, and anachronism. There's, there's a Wendy's drive through immediately to the west of here that's effectively 10 feet from the house that's on the west. You know, they all back up to that, that 120 stall parking lot to the south. So that's the adjacent use there. And then the cemeteries to the east and, and all of the homes that are across 13th. Uh, are generally oriented away from this facade. So we're looking at the garages across the street. So there's there's not a lot of engagement with the kind of residential portion of the neighborhood that's around there. Um, you know, we view it that that node as a good opportunity to deliver some kind of transitional housing that isn't broadly available in this area. You know, it's it's apartments at kind of a medium scale uh, that would be uh, another option from what's largely kind of single family homes up in this area. As, as another potential um, just housing option up there. Um, you know, to, to address the comment that was made, we, we haven't really looked at this as a kind of fourplex um, approach for, for those three parcels. We've just, we've just thought of it as it, rolling these in the, the parking lot to the south makes for uh, the ability to make kind of a more functional overall development for the whole thing. Uh, if, if, if these aren't included in that parking lot, it becomes a little more tricky to redevelop that piece. Not that it wouldn't be possible, but it just it makes it a little bit more challenging just on the footprint and efficiency standpoint. So, um, you know, that's the approach we've had. We think it's, you know, consistent with the the master plans of the area, you know, the East Bench master plan and, and the other kind of relevant plans here we'll like to focus kind of development along Foothill. Uh, they want to focus along um, you know, existing retail corridors where we'd be able to retain the retail and kind of deliver more residents to service the retail is to the west right there. So for a lot of reasons, you know, we think it's a, a great location with great access to kind of main thoroughfares and, and you know, making this zoning consistent with the rest of that block uh, makes a lot of sense from, from our perspective. So I'm, I, don't, I don't need to take a ton of time. I'm happy to answer any questions or, or um, you know, address any concerns that, that any of the council members have. Thank you so much. Council members, questions, comments? Yes, Council Member Mono. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if, the, if Tyler, you can confirm which parcels would be in a potential 
redevelopment and I guess maybe more specifically, which ones you or the client, the landowner that you represent own, it's the three houses plus the entirety of the parking lot and the, the old red Robin building, or is it not the red Robin building, just part of the parking lot? Yeah. Also the, the red Robin, the parking, and then these three parcels. So the, the intent would be for the red Robin to say, we would try to maintain, uh, I think, you know, 30 to 40 surface stalls as part of the circulation that would kind of service that restaurant and allow it to kind of be there and function properly and then have an apartment building tucked to the east of that. Okay. And then the, the gas station Wendy's is, is separate as well as the hotel. Those are owned by yeah. separate people. Yeah. Those would not be, those would not be a part of any redevelopment there. All right, great. And then Madam Chair, if it's okay the, to staff, does CB zone have any maximum lot sizes or maximum? I, I, in my experience, CBs, I, I see typically more in like smaller parcels mm-hmm. as zone CB. This one seems like it would be a pretty large parcel for, and it sounds like they're going to keep the, the restaurant separate, but if they were to incorporate the restaurant and the full parking lot and the three houses, that to me feels like a pretty big like acreage wise parcel for a cb is that am i thinking of that correctly or i don't have that in front of me unless one of my fellow planners has that i do know again the footprint of an individual building is limited or at least once it goes over 7500 it's got to go to design review but i don't have that right in front of me that makes sense this parcel is actually not unusual for the CB zone. Most of our grocery stores are actually located in the CB. Gives you an idea of what's out there in that zone. Okay. Anyone uh, else? Council Member Dugan? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, th- thanks for that. And I, I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate the idea of uh, the community and the, and the additional uh, apartments and stuff. But it seems like those are great benefits for the developer. Uh, but, you know, we're the city is has an initiative for affordable housing on these three properties uh, and i don't see any uh benefit from the city standpoint of us saying okay we're going to allow you to rezone these three properties at a at a benefit to yourself but not so much of a benefit to the the community or the the city in, in general uh is there uh thoughts on affordable housing I mean, that's why we did the affordable housing initiative was to increase affordable housing and uh, allow uh, some mixed use housing and and maybe some smaller residents in different areas. Uh, but I don't see there any any notion on uh, affordability on your on your uh, mixed income and the, and the sizes of your units. Are they studio one bedrooms? I know this is more into into the development side of the house and not so much of the land use, but that's all takes place in our thought process when we're going to say, hey, we're going to rezone this. Yeah, I love to rezone this, but you know that I, to me, the the community could say I want to see green space, and I see a nice three lots of green space here instead of a a big apartment complex with very little green space and and uh, and not much 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 for us, but a lot for you, uh, the developer. No, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And again, um, for for the kind of four flex option, it is it's. That's something we've gone down the path of a lot, honestly, for from from a development standpoint, um, with three existing houses there that um, you know you can, that are existing rentals right now. Financially, it's unlikely that it'll make sense to convert those to four flexes with a portion of that being affordable. It, it's just the the construction cost and, and the incremental rent is, is unlikely to work itself out based on other lots that we've looked at. I can't say that for certain here and I haven't spent a lot of time on on the fourplex initiative but it's that uh, they would likely more likely stay the, the single family homes than they would convert to kind of fourplexes with affordable housing but to your point that's not necessarily a, a bad outcome for some of the neighbors I think they would probably prefer to see these stay um single family homes from 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 our perspective I mean I think that the piece for us that that having these three homes rezoned is it allows a more thoughtful kind of redevelopment of the parking lot to the south, which I think would would benefit kind of broadly in the community there to get rid of just the the kind of expanse of, of asphalt that's there. Again, there's obviously a benefit to the owner and the developer as well for the opportunity to do that. But it's in a it, to maintain the restaurant where it is, have the parking that's available and have some sort of redevelopment. There's not enough space without these three homes to do all three. 
I think we would certainly be be open to kind of leveraging any of the, the affordable housing tools to include those as as options of any kind of future redevelopment here. We have had um, not a ton of luck with that in the past, uh, making it uh, kind of feasible from our end. And we've uh, kind of uh, explored, you know, uh, trying to deliver affordable units by working with the unit mix uh, and trying to make them, you know, the gross dollars affordable. But I think that's semantics versus kind of a big A affordable option. But, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of exploring that and trying to figure out a, a way to make it work here and, you know, as some portion of the delivery. But as as configured, it's, the, you know, the expectation of it would be a, kind of a market rent product. Yeah, I appreciate it. Because, it, I mean, one of our biggest tenants, I should say not one of our biggest, some of our biggest tenants is affordable housing in general, but also affordable family housing. And that would be uh, th three bedrooms, two to three bedroom units also. Uh, and, you know, when we're so hard pressed f to find affordable units, uh, not just in my district, but in another other districts uh, for families, it would be nice to see uh, those being part of the proposal. If, especially if we were to uh, eliminate three, I would say affordable houses uh, on a in a nice location in a nice area, uh, to add add to that mix of affordability uh, in in the design here. Council Member Dugan, you are thrilling my soul that you're offering your district to be the first one to innovate our affordable housing incentives. Like thrilling me. <laughs> Um, council members, any other questions, comments, concerns? We, uh, Madam we are, Chair, yes, sir. I'll just I'll say really quickly that uh, I, Tyler, if you would, I, I'd be interested in knowing whether you, your team would be interested, would be a, would be amenable to, um, even if it's not developing under the affordable housing incentives initiative ordinance, entering into a development agreement that would, uh, that would agree to put some affordable housing on the property if it was rezoned to CB. That's a little different than what Councilmember Dugan's saying. And so, but I, I'd be interested in knowing if that would be it, something you'd be amenable to is, is saying if we can, if we do approve the zoning, you will deliver certain a number of units or percentage of units. I, I don't know what that would look like, but uh, to echo what Councilmember Dugan said, affordable housing is something that's really big in our city of families as well, but also affordable housing in high opportunity areas which I believe this qualifies as. So I'm um, getting affordable housing in that area would be a really big win for the community, I think, even if it's a small percentage of affordable housing units and, and having you know, the majority of them still be market rate, I think even a little bit of affordable housing up there to me would feel like a win. Um, not saying that's 100% required for, for me to consider it, but that, that I'd be interested in, in what your team would be willing to offer. Um, I mean, I think you know what our preference would be, right? Is to to not have any additional limitations on it. I I I uh, I would have to speak with with Jim and the owner to to discuss his kind of openness to that type of thing. My 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 only concern, and again, I know that this is not something that that you need to consider this as, from a different perspective than we do. But there's you know there's a percentage of affordable housing that 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 you hit at some point where then it's just not a feasible product or project, right? Where it, it becomes a limitation to being able to build it all. And I don't, I can't speak intelligently about what that number is without spending time to look into it. I, I my response to you would be like, I'm, I'm happy to look into it and have that discussion for sure, but I couldn't commit to anything without I, spending more time on it. I understand that your, your preference would be no restriction on that or no, no agreement to that at all. But yeah. the other, the option would be then, I mean, this is a, a rezone, so it's, totally discretionary no, I, so we, yeah if if the answer were no but for some affordability what would be that level i think is the question and i'm not saying yeah, that, I, that I, is the situation but i consider i, I think that's that's the way i received the, the comment is what is what is the number that could be tolerable that would help kind of make this make this feel good for everybody and and if it was a no but um you know we can we can review it under that uh from that perspective and think about it but yeah i don't i don't have enough information just off the top of my head to, to give you an answer one way or the other. But I do I, I I appreciate your position. I think I understand where you're coming from. We can spend some time on it. <laughs> Madam Chair, I changed my mind. Yes, <laughs> yes Council Member, please. I, I I mean I you know I uh, I'm interested on 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 the thought. Uh, 
you know brought up here uh, as far as including some affor affordability to this project and i um i think that you know simple math will tell you that there is some interest here on getting some place there uh and uh you know that you know we you you're going to need some the support of the council members here to to approve this and there is uh an interest here on finding some affordability uh uh, some level of affordability on these projects, and I will be interested in looking into that uh, for me to support the general project at this moment. So just putting it out there. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you guys uh, are creative enough and can figure something out. And uh, I, and I'm not looking for a lot. I'm also not looking for uh, necessarily the to apply the new uh, ordinances and you know the new tools that we have but if you wish to explore the new tools that we we have out there uh, as a city uh, uh we'll love to to see some of that uh, be an exercise and you know on the east side of the city i would love to see some of, some of probability there but but yeah that I just wanted to put it on the record that i'm interested in seeing some creativity on that aspect yeah I I uh, noted and we'll think about it. I I would put out there one more wrinkle, and this is um, just for additional color. Is um, you know the I think generally the this is being requested without a kind of development plan for the apartment, uh, and I say that being that it's possible that that Jim may decide to go a different direction. So like he may, if this is approved or not, he may end up leaving these homes. He may end up deciding that just kind of a full commercial use makes more sense here. So I would want to be careful as we go down that path that it doesn't bind him in some way to to a plan aside from the affordable housing that, all right, this is committed to apartments. He's still, I think he's still considering the options here as we go down this path. It's just the CB zone gives him more potential options in terms of what can be done then, all right? Okay, thank you. We good? All right, guys, this is my first meeting. I'm gonna keep us on schedule. We're getting behind already. All right, uh, thank you everyone. We will move on then to the next uh, piece of business, which is an ordinance regarding the Avenue's restricted covenant. Brian Fulmer gets to keep his seat. And then Eric, now Chrissy and, guys, the names today. Now I get to hang out with Chrissy and Kelsey. So, all right, welcome friends. Thank you. Uh, this is a proposal to remove a restrictive covenant from 18 properties located primarily between B Street and D Street and between 9th Avenue and 11th Avenue in City Council District 3. The covenant ensured that these properties would be limited to single and two family or other uses that conform to the R2 zoning that was in effect back when the covenants were established in 1981. And now I'll turn it over to Chrissy. Yeah, thank you. So I did have some slides, but we probably don't need them because it's just really the map. Um, so this request came about from last spring. I was reviewing a lot consolidation and we discovered that there was a restrictive covenant on the property that would prohibit the property owner from constructing an ADU. And then after looking into it there, we discovered that it was also on 17 other properties. And after internal discussions, um, the planning division decided to move forward and see if the city council might be interested in removing that covenant from those properties. So this came about in 1981 um, with the closure of 8th Avenue between C and D Street. And from our understanding, unfortunately, the records aren't great, but the, the recorder's office was able to help me find some documentation but my understanding is that the Greater Avenues Community Council agreed to not oppose that restriction if these properties underwent that restrictive covenant. And after talking to the Greater Avenues Community Council, it appears that those 18 properties used to be used as um, homes for traveling doctors or for families of sick patients. And since that time, those homes have now been sold and they are no longer owned by LDS Hospital. And so um, we can go to the next slide. Then. There we go. Um, since they're no longer owned by LDS Hospital and since the 80s, um, you know, things have changed. ADUs are now a thing. Um, it might be appropriate to remove that covenant at this time. So you can see on that map that they're primarily surrounding the hospital. There is one down in the corner that's kind of hard to see. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, that covenant was 
primarily has to do with the use. It says that those properties should maintain an R2 use that was in effect of that time. And so the biggest impact from this removal would be that those properties would now be able to follow the SR1A zone that they're currently zoned as. Um, and so they would now be allowed to have an accessory dwelling unit, which I think is what most people are interested in. And then you can see the other uses like a congregate care facility, a community garden, a daycare center. And I wanted to re reiterate um, that just because those uses would be permitted or conditional by removing the covenant, it doesn't mean that they're automatically guaranteed to have that use. They still must meet all the zoning requirements for that use. And that was very short and sweet, but that's all I had and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Council members, questions for staff? Council member Dugan. Thank you for the clarity. Cause I was looking at these houses going, how's it just a scattergram, but it was because they were owned by the LDS hospital for each use they didn't want to have the ADU. So the rest of them don't have a covenants on them. The rest of the houses, it's just these 18 units. Yeah. Okay. And I think the concern from the community council at the time was that they, the hospital might sell them for some commercial use and they wanted to prevent that from happening. Okay. Um, Anyone else? Questions? We're good. All right. Thank you. Okay. Always Thank good you. to see you friends. All right. We will move on to our next order of business. Uh, an ordinance regarding the community benefit and tenant displacement amendments. We're going to switch Brian out for Alice and Roland from council office. Uh, Nick Norris, Chrissy and Kelsey are already in place. They get to keep their seats. So, is Allison joining us virtually? All right. One moment, friends. We're going to give Allison a, a second to scoot on over here. They are not used to us being ahead of schedule. Everyone is prepared for us to be behind. But you all were so good on that last presentation. You recouped time for us. Can I say? So. <laughs> I'm good. Sorry, we gave you the false impression that you had time to go get a drink, Allison. <laughs> there will be no drinking. That's right. No sustaining life functions. Well, I apologize for making everybody late. Um, this is the community benefit and tenant displacement <laughs> amendments. Um, <laughs> And uh, this is a, a series of ordinance changes and um, an addition to city code that planning has suggested as part of a, as part of the follow-up to the thriving in place plan that the council approved last fall. I'm going to leave it at that because otherwise I would be freelancing and that's not a good idea. So I will pass it to the planners. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. So um, as Allison mentioned, this is a community benefit and displacement amendments. It uh, impacts Title 19, well, a new Title 19, 21A50, and then Title 18. And then we can go to the next slide and actually one more past that. So as Allison mentioned, this is this came about from Thriving in Place, which was um, started in 2021 and went through new um, rounds of public outreach. And through that process, the it was found that, and I know you were all aware of, well of it, but displacement is significantly getting worse in Salt Lake City. Um, there are no more affordable neighborhoods and just that there's um, not enough housing units overall. And so out of thriving in place, you can go to the next slide. Um, there were four policy goals for the planning division to address. And the first one was establish a community benefit policy, create a tenant relocation assistance program, require replacement housing units, and require data on housing. And so that's how we got here today. And that's what we will be proposing to you today is how to address those policy goals. Um, next slide, and then one more past that. So I first want to start with that how these amendments apply and what they apply to. These amendments um, apply to general plan amendments. So if an applicant is amending the Plan Salt Lake or any neighborhood plans, and then um, any zoning or text, so any zoning amendments, a text amendment, a map amendment. 
Um, so the first part of this is Title 19, and Title 19 is a new chapter of our city code that is was created to meet state law, to meet LEDMA. Um, this defines what the general plan is. So like I mentioned, the general plan is considered Plan Salt Lake, and then any elemental plans that have a land use component, so our neighborhood plans, the transportation master plan, for example. Um, Title 19 also goes over criteria for when a plan must be amended, um, also what that what the plans must include to meet city city requirements and state law. And then it goes over the petition process for both private property owners and city initiated um, comprehensive updates. Next slide, please. And then Title 19 also includes what, and I'll go over each of these in detail in a moment, but the community benefit policy um, required assistance for relocation assistance for displaced tenants and then required um, replacement dwellings if a, if a proposal will result in the demolition of a dwelling and then inclusion of demographic data and displacement considerations. So basically new standards for consideration of review when you are reviewing a zoning or general plan amendment. And then next slide. And then this next part of this is chapter 21A50, which is our zoning amendments chapter. And so anytime a property owner is amending the zoning map, um, whether the property whether the proposal meets the general plan or not, just a zoning amendment, they would also be subject to these requirements with the, the same thing that was in Title 19, the community benefit policy and so forth. And we've attempted to keep the language very consistent between both chapters um, because sometimes a property owner might be subject to one or the other or both, and so they're consistent for that reason. Um, next slide. And then the third part of this is Title 18, which will also be amended. So a major goal through this process um, that was identified and thriving in place was to remove the housing loss mitigation ordinance, which has been shown to be largely ineffective. And so through this process, the housing loss mitigation ordinance will be deleted and replaced with these amendments in Title 19 and Title 21A50. And then the demolition ordinance will also be amended just to ensure consistency, um, like it will now have new data collection requirements, for example. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just to get into the details of each one of these major policy considerations. So the first one is a community benefit policy. So when a property owner is applying to amend the general plan or a zoning text zoning map or text amendments, they will now be required to propose what's called a community benefit, and they must select an item from this list. So housing, which includes the provision of affordable housing or family-sized housing, um, dedicated dedication of public accessible open spaces, support for local businesses, um, and the planning commission added in and char or charitable organizations, um, preservation of critical lands, so this includes like wetland habitat and so forth, historic building preservation and expansion of public infrastructure beyond, beyond what is already required. And then along with that, the the ordinance also has factors to consider these amendments. So are they proportional to the increase in development? If there is a really great um, increase in development potential, then the community benefit proposed should also be very great. Um, and another example is like if they're proposing to do public accessible open space, how does that relate to the size of the project and the overall square footage of the of the lot? Um, and then finally on the community benefit policy is that this would be secured through a development agreement with the city council. And ultimately, this is up to the discretion of the council. They could choose to waive the, the community benefit, um, modify it, or require something different. Uh, next slide. And then tenant relocation. So if a property has the potential to displace people, and this only applies to people, not commercial businesses. So if it, if it has potential to displace people, the applicant would be subject to um, covering moving expenses up to $1,500, um, fee assistance, so like the deposit or any other fees associated with the application, rental payment assistance to cover the difference between the existing rent and the new rent, which would not exceed $7,200. And then if the, the property owner also has the option to relocate the to a property they already own, and in that case, um, they wouldn't be subject to the fee assistance because that would already be covered. And 
there was some confusion on this item. So this is not intended to be a city run process. This is intended to be fully on the applicant, the property owner and their tenants. And so the city wouldn't have a fund. These month, this would just be purely on the their side and they would just need to provide proof um, that they met this obligation. And it could also be included in the development agreement that this obligation is met. Uh, next slide. And then housing replacement. So if a property is likely to demolish existing housing, the petitioner may be required to either replace the dwelling units at the same size and same rental rate, um, or they would be required to replace the dwelling units at the same size and same rental rate, um, or limit or limit the rental rate. Um, sorry, I messed up the text on this slide. But basically, they have to replace those units. and. They could either choose between doing a no more than 3% annual increase on those units over 20 years, or they could do a payment to the city, which would be the existing unit rent times by the months it costs it takes to replace that unit, and that equals a payment. So I gave an example in the staff report of they demolish the unit and it takes them 36 months to um, get their certificate of occupancy, and the unit rent was $1,000, the payment would be $36,000. And that would also be secured at the end through a development agreement. Okay, and next slide. And then standards for amendments. So there are new consideration standards, and really they're just expanded consideration standards for the planning staff, planning commission, and city council to review when reviewing a zoning amendment um, or text amendment. And these assess whether the community benefit is appropriate, the potential to displace people and businesses. It also looks into expanded consideration regarding the impact to city services and then proximity to amenities, and this includes fresh food. And then next slide. And then data collection. So Thriving in Place called for collecting more data so that we can analyze um, displacement that's happening. So applicants would now be subject to including information on the housing unit rent and sizes in their application. Um, they would need to include the number of bedrooms and the current rent going back 36 months with their applications now. And then next slide. So just to cover public engagement, um, we produced a story map, an online story map that went through each one of these and went into quite a bit of detail on the amendments. There were three public open houses that were, I think, fairly well attended. And then we also held development community roundtable meetings with um, representatives from the development community. And as noted in the, the staff report and transmittal, um, the development community their biggest concern was that 3% rental rate restriction over 20 years and just that it was too hard for their bottom line and their performa to understand and predict and that they would have preferred um, some type of fee or payment to the city. And that's where that change in the ordinance came about. And that was all I have. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, before I open it up to council, can I get a clarification as to whether this applies when there's a zoning map amendment or a master plan amendment? Mm -hmm. It applies to both. So either one. If someone is just asking for a change in zoning, we would be able yes. to. Mm -hmm. that, thank you. That was an important clarification. Um, I've got a bunch of things. Let me start with Pui and then we'll go to Lopez Travis. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, uh, you know, it seems like you mentioned that we, the city won't be running the program itself like it will be a requirement by the the those managing uh, those properties or you know trying to change uh the zoning or the project or whatnot but how how are we going to enforce this uh, and you know and how much uh, cost wise it's going to um you know how much you know infrastructure do we need you know this in general i mean i i'm looking forward to these changes uh or, or you know to to add some of these tools to uh to our neighbors but um i am worried about uh, how do we ensure that they're doing what they say they're doing um if that makes sense and and how do we check that you know uh, reasonable you know reasonable notice is given and all of these things are are, are and you know some people don't have that relationship with the um with with the landowner uh and you know some some tenants don't and i i'm worried that there's going to be some we're going to have something on the books and we're now going to uh, mm -hmm. um, make sure that it works and that is my my main concern at the moment yeah and that's understandable so as far as the first part of your question about staff resources and managing that um i think that because of that's run on the the applicant side it 
<laughs> Nick can correct me. I don't think we need extra staff for this part of it. It will require quite a bit more um, analysis from planning's perspective and looking at the community benefit policy and public outreach and meetings. Um, however, I do think you, we could potentially see less applications, which will make up for that gap in the amount of time that staff's reviewing these. Um, as far as making sure that the applicant and the property owner is accurately you know, getting that information to tenants, um, we would require that they provide evidence of that. Um, we also want to know the current you know, tenants on site and the, their information so we can verify those things. Um, they could either submit that with their application, but I think much more likely this would end up being a requirement through the development agreement that this obligation is met. Councilwoman Lopez Travis. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the housing replacement fund. I wanted to know, um, you know, is that a replenishing fund? Is that helping uh, commit to these actions? I'm really excited by this. I think these are necessary protections, but better trying to understand the funding mechanism behind it. Um, I know you mentioned that the onus and responsibility of payback is to the applicant, um, but that, that was something I was curious about. Yeah, there, so there is a difference. So the tenant relocation assistance, like the $1,200 in moving expenses, that's on the property owner oh. side. But the payment to the city for um, the replacement units, that, that fee, that would be on the city side to manage. And I'm not completely sure how that fee would work and how that fund would work. And I think that's a question that we need to, you know, discuss and look into, like, you know, exactly how that would be spent and um, where it would go. Yeah, I mean, just a comment for us to think about and immediately where my um, inquiry comes from is there's been a lot of uh, units and depletion, specifically, I think of an example on 200 South and 800 East in our community, it is central where um, four homes were brought to us earlier last year uh, or in 2022, um, and the city had the opportunity to upzone. Luckily, we were able to protect those properties, but once again, those property owners are seeking to upzone, or there's there's a hearsay of that. So I think, out of transparency, I'd love to see what you know what benefit does this fund create potentially for this neighborhood um, if we had to upzone these properties. So just wanted to put that on the record. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Romano. So thank you, Madam Chair. So if I'm understanding correctly, there's really if I if I'm a property owner asking for either a uh, general plan amendment or a rezone then there's three things i need to comply with at the time that that rezone or plan amendment is granted and that would be community community benefit policy the tenant relocation and the housing replacement and those second two are i'm assuming if housing exists if housing doesn't exist there would be no tenant relocation or housing replacement Correct. But for any kind of rezone, so let's say this one that we just looked at in District 6, um, they would have to choose one of these seven things, housing, open space, local businesses, one or more of those to say, here's what we're providing in, not in payment for or anything like that, but like to qualify for consideration for a rezone, we're proposing these community benefits. And then on the three homes, assuming that those are rented out, right now they would have to pay up to seventy two hundred dollars per unit to relocate those tenants and then also replace at least three units or pay or do a payment mm -hmm. to a fund that could help create units somewhere else is that yeah so they might be really broad terms is am no, i understanding correctly you've got it so the real first part the relocation assistance it's seventy two hundred dollars to cover the difference in rent plus twelve hundred dollars to help them move so a closer to ten ten thousand dollars per unit um, and then no matter what they do have to replace those three units so say they're building 20 three of those 20 they would consider that replacement and they either need to limit the rent on those units um to three percent per you know for 20 years or they would have to do that payment to the city and then um the tenant relocation money goes directly to those tenants mm -hmm. so i guess my concern is I, this is all good and i, I like I, I like the direction of it but my concern is that we get somebody just like before asking for it the rezone going in and a increasing their rent dramatically because we have no rent control in the state. So just increasing their rent dramatically. And then a year later coming in and saying, well, my rent is really high already, so I don't have to pay any difference in rent. 
and I'm going to replace these units at this really high rent, um, assuming they can get that, which they may be able to, um, or just displacing their tenants a year before they ask for the thing and saying these are vacant houses. How do we? Yeah, and we've had the same you know conversations and concern, and they're. I'll see if I can find the exact language. There is language in here that allows us to look back five years and if a property owner has um, purposely evicted or um, ended a lease for the purposes of avoiding these obligations, then we could look into that. But it, that is a consideration and we've, we've tr tried to address that through the language in here. Um, let me see if I can find it. And that would just be on, we'd have to figure out how to prove that that happened within the last five years. Yeah. Well, and that's why we require them to submit at least three years of data. Um, the idea behind that is so that somebody couldn't game the process. Um, and then um, there, there are ways that we can try to find out tenancy and length of that um, through various data sources, but it's going to require some research. The idea is that if somebody goes through and does that, then that would be reasons to say no. To their proposal i guess i mean what a what about the situation where somebody like say there is a home that it is for sale and or a, a property somebody buys it and wants to develop it but actually just bought it so they don't have three years of of history how do we would just say no to them like wait for three years and come back or how do how do they qualify to develop that parcel because what I don't want is a bunch of dilapidated old properties sitting there being underutilized or vacant until they have three years of proof that it yeah. was vacant. So, so we purposely don't dictate what data, like the data source that they provide us to accommodate for that because they can use information provided by the tenants if they want. If they don't have that, if they've been there. Nick said, though, that most of these developers that are going forward have done this before, and they will be able to collect that rental data with their due diligence. Um, and like, hopefully they do that part, but. Okay. Yeah. I think there's also the reality that some, there will be some proposals that on their face are community benefits, right? And we don't want to shut the door on that. So for, you know, an obvious example is say somebody, even this last uh, proposal that you saw in front of you, um, you know, if somebody came in to open in, in what was those four homes, a, um, you know, a medical provider that provided mental health services, that's increasing the access to mental health in the city, which is a need that in and of itself may be a community benefit, not require anything in, in addition to it. Councilwoman Young. Yeah. So just to follow up with Councilmember Mono, I do appreciate you looking at um, the the code through the lens of not incentivizing the vacant buildings um just because i know anytime new code comes into play that's kind of the first like okay so like what could i do to potentially like skirt you know some of these requirements and pieces like that so just appreciate that as as a lens my other quick question was just in relationship to any of the the code related to any of the city rda properties and efforts so how do those pieces interact so this does apply to city owned property where the city is looking at rezoning or changing the plan for individual pieces. We we would be treated no different than any other property owner. So we ideally through the RDA, there would be a community benefit included in that, right? Um, it's a different situation if we're doing a comprehensive change. So if 
if, for example, you know, acting as the RDA board, you you have all seen the uh, proposed changes to Station Center, for example, that ask for more height. If, if we go in and rezone, or change the zoning regulations in that on those blocks to allow more height, that would be more of a comprehensive approach where you can balance out whether or not you need to have a community benefit or not. If we are rezoning an entire corridor, it would be impossible to come up with a community benefit that the city could provide to itself or, or to, a, to the community. And so the idea behind those types of changes is that the change itself is leading to that benefit. So if we're rezoning a corridor, it's either providing more space for housing, more space for business, et cetera. Councilor, please. That's super helpful. Thank you. Uh, just a little uh, more uh, explanation on the uh, benefits on the on the benefits that you know since those um, uh, six that are listed in there, the um, preservation of critical lands. Um, just to pick a few, expansion of public infrastructure. Um, are those meant to be on site, or they could be someplace else? Are they, I guess the word that I, I just came up with—I don't know if this is a real word—and I make those all the time. But swappability: can we swap some of these public benefits to a different area nearby? It, it is. It, can they provide these other benefits not in the in the site? Is that allowed by this ordinance? So it doesn't specifically say that it has to be on site, but the intent is that this is to benefit and, you know, re relieve that impact of this development on the immediate neighborhood. However, it does allow discretion that if there is some, you know, really significant benefit they could propose off site that that could be looked into. Okay. So that would allow for some of that. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have some questions. So on the benefits, I don't think that housing is a benefit. It's proven that people want to build housing here. Um, I think the housing should have to prove that it fits into some sort of deficit, whether that be family size or that workforce housing or deeply affordable. Like, I don't want to limit it just to affordable housing. We know we have a gap um, from the 80 to 125 range, but I just don't think we need 200% affordability, even though maybe financing on that is easier for a developer and it technically would be housing. Um, yeah. So I'd like I'd like more clarity on that term that distinguishes that the housing has to meet our community needs, not it, a balance sheet. If I remember the wording in the proposal correctly, it says that it, it does tie it to a housing need. So it isn't just we're providing 100 additional one bedroom apartments. Awesome. And then the other th thing is. We always consider sustainability as a community benefit, and I don't see it listed here. Is that is there a reason why it's not listed as benefit, or are we just it are probably, we building that is already being built so, in? Don't ask for it anymore. <laughs> I think there there is because a lot of sustainability. Um, I'm trying to word this right, but for example, like LEED certified buildings and things like that, they <laughs> don't really align well with the land use approval process, because some of those you can't actually get that certification until after the building's completed. And once that happens, there's no going back for the city. Okay. And so it, it's just a lot harder for us to evaluate that. That doesn't mean that there aren't some things that are sustainability in nature. And I think we've included some of those like per preserving the sensitive lands and things like that. Um, but ideally our code would be set up so that all development has some sustainability benefits, whether it's growth near transit or growth in business districts, things like that. Um, and under public infrastructure, I would like specifically to see walkability as the infrastructure and, and those sorts of things. Um, and then on the tenant relocation, um, the tenant will get to choose, right? What I would hate to see is a landlord says, I've got a unit over here and they are moved a disproportionate air, you know, distance away from work or from kids or from family members, and they have to take that or they get no assistance moving. Like it should be a menu that's determined by what works best for the tenant who's being displaced. Is that? Yeah, that's the intent that the tenant would choose where they're relocated. Um, and then are we to understand in this presentation, rental rate and AMI are the same thing. We don't usually use the term rental rate. Was it meant to be a synonymous with AMI or is there another way we're calculating it in this instance? Yeah. So do you mean the, the calculation to come up with that payment, the rental rate by? 
Uh, I was thinking more of the preservation when we say that oh, okay. they can, they would have to offer it at the same rental rate and same size with a 3% escalator over 20 years. Um, that area. Wait. Let me see. I'm I, gonna... If my memory serves me, <laughs> which, um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> but the AMI, I, I think we avoided using AMI because it adjusts with um, like the, the yearly income and inflation, right? And so we backed away from using AMI and just went to rental rate. Right? So that it would be more applicable and are we standing on firm I know AMI is something that like HUD does, so like it's so not controversial, like we're on really firm ground. Mm -hmm. Are are we on firm ground with this concept or is this gonna require us to define a lot of things and create I, algorithms of our own? I don't recall any um angst from the attorney's office with rental rate. Okay. All right, those are all my questions. Any one else? Good. All right. Thank you, planning staff. You have completely killed it today. All right. We're going to let economic development come up now instead, and we're going to hear about the Economic <laughs> Development Loan Fund for EATS LLC. I see Roberta and the trader Brian Pantel coming up. <laughs> and Allison gets to keep her seat. Hello. <laughs> hey, trader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I now have signed into my computer so I can do a proper introduction. Um, this is an this is an economic development loan fu loaned fund loan to Eat LLC, which is a vegan bakery specializing in donuts, sweet rolls, and cookies. The EDLF loan committee recommended the council approve a one hundred thousand dollar loan at seven point seven five fixed rate interest over seven years. The loan will assist in the creation of three new jobs in the next year and retention of two existing jobs. And the equipment owned by the business would be used as collateral for the loan, including a food truck slash trailer to be purchased with loan proceeds. So I will turn it over to you all. Thanks, Allison. Great to see you all. Um, I'm Roberta Reichelt with Economic Development. Um, Allison mentioned we have a loan from Eats Bakery. I just want to mention a few things about Eats. Um, this is a woman minority um, veteran owned business. Um, we've been working with them for about a year and a half now, slow, slowly pulling them away from where they were operating down south um, because they've been surviving basically off of um, farmers markets and in various markets. You guys have probably seen them. They're, they're a staple at the downtown farmers market and there's been a, a huge demand for their product. And so um, as great business owners, they've been very conservative about their pr approach and next steps. And so we're working with them and um, potentially moving them into a brick and mortar, but they wanted to first um, see what, what would happen if they did a, a food trailer. So that would be able to open up their business line substantially more than what they're doing now just at the markets without those sort of overhead uh, costs that like a brick and mortar might um, uh, afford. However, that is their long-term goal to have to be fully established here in Salt Lake. So if you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you, Roberta. Council, any questions, comments, concerns? We're very easy to please. So thank you for your best. time. <laughs> thank you for your support for all our local businesses. It was good to see you. All right, Council, this means seven, we get seven extra minutes for my favorite topic and yours, which is budget amendment three. <laughs> Ben Ludke, <laughs> Ben Ludke, if you'd like to come up for council staff. And then, of course, we'll take Mary, Beth, Lisa, and Greg from our budget office. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Uh, just a reminder, last week, the council took a straw poll supporting, and it was a unanimous straw poll, supporting item A1. This was a proposal for four civilian paramedics in the fire department. On the formal meeting agenda tonight, there is a potential vote for remaining items in Budget Amendment Number 3. Uh, if there is an item you do not want to vote on or you want to vote on separately, let me know so I can update the motion sheet for tonight. Right after the budget amendment vote, uh, there is a resolution listed which is related to item A1. It is a request for 
social workers and civilian paramedics to be added to the tier two firefighter retirement system. Uh, so two separate votes, two items next to each other on the formal meeting agenda tonight. Thank you, Ben. Uh, before I dive into the remaining items, we do have an update uh, for you on fund balance and revenues through the end of last fiscal year. And I'll turn it over to finance for the update. The council members, you did request this as context for considering the rest of the items in the budget amendment. So that's why we're doing this first. Good afternoon, council members. I'm gonna start and then we're gonna kind of go all the way down the line. So you don't have to listen to me the whole entire time. Um, next slide, please. So in fiscal year 2023, we dropped $41.86 million from revenues to the fund balance. Majority of this is sales tax and interest um, as you can see on this slide, I wanted to point out that there was a large spike in May and June. So note that May and June revenues don't come in until July or August. So we would have not known that that spike was going to occur primarily for sales tax is where that's coming from. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then next slide, please. This is the slide that just shows you where we have received more revenues at 26 million for sales tax and an additional 9 million for interest income. Um, yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg and he's going to talk through expenditures. Yeah, thanks, Mary Beth. Um, so while we were looking at revenues, we'd also wanted to provide a quick update on our expenditures from last year as well. Um, so the slide here, uh, yes, thank you. Um, so this is a quick summary of our expenditures from fiscal year 23. Um, so as you can see, uh, the chart here basically depicts a $30 million um, balance below our budget for the year on the expenditure side. The next slide um, focuses on our personnel services. So um, this is primarily our expen expenditures around our staff and our people, if you will. Um, so for this category alone, um, we did see about $15.7 million of expenses below budget for the year. And on the next slide, um, you can see here the fiscal year 23 um, vacancy savings by department. Um, so what this does, uh, these totals here accumulate to the 15.7 million that I mentioned prior um, and are broken out by department. Um, so you can see this is the balance that returned to fund balance, strictly looking at the personal services category um, with the big balances here seen in the uh, police department, um, public services, and then some smaller values across the departments as well. So it's one time savings. There is nothing structurally different in the fund balance and in the expenses to which we've committed ourselves. It's just that we didn't hire the person or they're not available. Yeah, I think that this proves the point of our difficulty in the city of hiring for, for fiscal year 2023. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Councilwoman Young and then Mono. Just a quick question. Back to the earlier one on personnel. I'm just wondering if those projections include the new FTEs that Council's approved related to the legislative um, director and supporting staff? No, this is only fiscal year 2023. So this is as of June 30th. Okay. Not going forward. Got it. Thank you. The 15.7 is part of the 30 that you said. It's not in addition to. Okay. Yeah, and I think the next slide might help a little bit. Um, so this is all, this is the total of the 30 million um, broken down by our major category, if you will. Um, so you can see that 15 million there for personnel services, um, about 9.7 million for our charges and services, 
and then um, some of the smaller balances in our other major categories or our ledger levels, if you will. Um, we did have a um, carry forward encumbrance of $21 million accounted for, where basically we brought, brought funding from fiscal year 23 into fiscal year 24 um, to account for some obligation expenditures. Um, we had already um, entered into a contract with or committed the city to. Um, so that is uh, the overall table here presents the, the 30 million by, by major category. So to repeat, none of this changes our expected ongoing revenues. It is one-time cost savings, and it's one time that we get but, this. But Madam Chair, but these are monies that we budgeted. So we, we, budgeted, we budgeted for this cost to be ongoing, if, at least the ones on personal services, uh, or at least the great majority of them. So we budgeted them to be ongoing, but it happens to... But as we, as we budget in the future, those things still have to be accounted for. It's not that there's 30 more million in our general fund to be expected next year so that we can grow by 30 million. Correct. I mean, I mean, obviously, when we budget, we hope to fill those vacancies, Correct. right? So, right. I, and, and there is something to say about why we're not filling those vacancies and, you know, are we, you know, at the top of the market and whatnot, but those are conversations Correct. that okay. we should have soon. So next slide, please. So this is our fund balance, and what uh, Council Member Petros said was correct. We dropped about $72 million in one-time funding to fund balance to take our fund balance to 38.05% in 2023. That means that our fund balance currently is 32.33%. This includes budget amendment number three. What is the point at which we're in violation? Is it 25%? 35. 35. And this will come up in the audit when we do the audit on February. in February. This is a compliance that we were out of compliance. Anyone else? Any questions, concerns, prayer requests on this? It's always exciting to have a little bit of a savings account. Were you going to say something? Okay. I just have the next slide, so whenever oh, you're okay. ready, I'll move on. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Council Member Dugan. So this is one-time funding, but you can uh, you can spread this over multiple years. So yes, it's one-time funding, but if you have forty million dollars, you don't need to spend it in this next year. You could appropriate it over a a longer period of time. So it could end up being a uh, long-term funding if you had some deferred maintenance that you needed to pay cost out or spend or some uh, additional uh, expenses that you needed but you didn't need 40 million up front I'm using just 40 million as a makeup number here but you could spend it over five years or ten years to cover those costs uh, for that time frame or we could have a really great rainy day fund so that we don't have to lay people off the next time we have a recession or uh, understood a governmental understood. So structure that doesn't like our priorities or things Under, like under that. understood yes there's a discussion we need to have but having too much money in your fund balance is not also healthy for the city there's other places so that's that we why can we can put it to right like cip we can we that's can what i was just saying when I, when, I use it, when I use the term deferred maintenance yeah. we have a lot of deferred maintenance out there Speaking that are expensive language, yeah. that we don't have enough money right now but if you could use some of this funding over the five years you could actually pay for all that deferred maintenance because it takes you again i'm just using five years as an example it takes you five years to complete all that deferred maintenance so and and a fund balance of 33 percent is not healthy fund balance of 15 percent is very healthy and you know or 15 to 16 percent is very healthy not 33 percent we're not using our money wisely. Thank Correct. you. Correct. All right. Should we let them move on? All right. Um, so that's the good news from last year. But if we move into the current year, um, the projections are here. Um, it, it does look like we are running under budget on revenues so far for the first few months of the year. Um, the biggest portion of that 
is sales tax. The sales tax is coming in lower than we expected. It's lower than the trend that we experienced last year. We right-sized our budget to account for that trend, but you know it's just not happening like we expected. Um, the other uh, portion of that that we're still sitting on is our interest. We've left it flat at this point because we just don't know what the economy is going to do want to hold out while we watch those indicators. But um, I did bring Andrew Reed, our sales tax expert, to kind of give you an update about which sectors of the tax market are affected right now. Over to yeah. any spots, or you want just to just move the mic over. That's as far as it goes. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, all right, so uh, this slide is just kind of some background information. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, so sales tax, um, as you all know, you know, we're all charged um, by basic goods um, at, at the supermarket or, or retail. Um, so sales, Salt Lake City is basically 1.75% uh, of the 7.75% that's charged at the sale. So, um, so for instance, um, if you were to buy a good for $100, you're going to pay a sales tax of $7.75. Salt Lake City's portion of that $7.75 would be $1.75 um, comes back to Salt Lake City. Um, we don't get that full $1 for the 1% back. Um, we'll get about 75% of that, and that's due to um, the 50-50 split um, distribution throughout the different cities um, throughout the state. Um, so that's kind of just the background on where um, sales tax comes from. Uh, the local general fund is 1%. Um, funding our future um, is the half percent. Um, and that goes um, towards, or that go, that's funds for funding our future. And then there's the county option, which is earmarked for um, transportation um, purposes. So um, go to the next slide, please. Um, so this um, is just an estimate on um, kind of what, what we're currently showing as our projection for actual our sales tax actuals and you can kind of see that our um, actuals year over year are coming in right about flat um, but we're definitely um, being really wary about this projection right now um, partly due because we don't know um, December or November sales from uh, from Christmas sales yet so we're kind of waiting um, until we really see the effects um, from the Christmas sales um, before we start really putting in a um, projection there. So you can go to the next one. Um, this is a breakout by major sector um, for the city. Um, so coming out of uh, last fiscal year, so many ind industries enjoyed healthy growth, um, such as retail accommodations of food, um, but this momentum has slowed greatly into uh, fiscal year 24. Um, the accommodations, food, and retail, you can see, are still flat or positive um, through the first quarter. And I, what I'm showing you is just year-over-year change of July through October sales. So we're leaving out the rest of um, comparing. We're just comparing apples to apples, um, the months that we've already seen compared to the months that happened last year. Um, so, but unfortunately, the sectors that are more interest rate sensitive seem to be taking a bigger hit this year. Um, so, um, looking at the table, you can kind of see sales tax revenue for, from accommodations and food are doing well, um, but not so much for wholesale trade, uh, manufacturing, construction, and information. Um, what, so, what is information? I'm sorry, Madam Chair. What is information? information. Uh, it's like tech company type stuff. So, um, uh, mar marketing and, um, uh, software, um, design type of sales. Um, so, um, some takeaways, you know, that we've kind of gathered so far, um, which we're still looking deeply into the, um, economic indicators for this, but, um, seems to be, there's a lack of business expansion. Um, so count of, so we've noticed that there's been a count of business accounts um, that are down in all of these major sectors. Um, and uh, business uh, license revenue is starting to, um, it's increasing year over year since 2020, but it's not um, back to the same levels as it was, um, as it was in the 
pre-pandemic times. Um, also, um, with lack of business expansion, we've seen a slowdown in um, uh, building and a drop in. So that will just kind of force the drop in construction, manufacturing, wholesale trade. Um, and this is just due to high costs of building and higher interest rates. Um, this information um, from the lack of business expansion and the slowdown in um, building construction is really consistent with the data that we see with uh, business licensing and um, building permit trends as well. So and that's kind of backing that. Um, the last point too that I wanted to make is, so we've, we've noticed too that it seems like there's a slowdown in discretionary spending. So um, not, seems like the consumer seems to be keeping up, but business to business um, types of sales um, have slowed down and it seems like kind of to the negative. So um, some kind of some positive uh, points to take away from this is you know, we have a very tight, tight labor force, um, the highest labor force, and we've seen on average since 2015. Um, so, you know, with with this tighter uh, working environment, it seems that businesses are resistant to um, shed their employees and they're more willing to increase wages right now. Um, also, it seems like the state, so um, the governor report just came out this last week, um, they expect to see um, statewide GDP growth to keep continuing. Um, and also inflation is trending down, even though um, it still seems to be uh, pretty high. Um, Thank you. Some negative points are, um, you know, while uh, many economic relationships, um, you know, it kind of seems like, like bus uh, business licensing and building permits, you know, are it's still kind of unknown where they are um, pre-pandemic levels. So um, yeah, that's kind of it. So I think that's all we have for the slides. Can't, thank you, Councilwoman Young. So yeah, I would say our vacancy um, report that we just got supports the fact that people are trying to hold on to their employees. Yeah. Um, I do have a quick question since we have you here. Um, in the fact that the state may be taking action um, with a constitutional amendment to remove their portion of the food tax, does that impact the city's no, tax? No, that, that's the state portion. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Council members, any other questions before we turn the reins back over? All right. Anything else from you all? That's it. All right. So I'm like deep breathing in a couple ways, both in relief and in deep responsibility right now. Council Member Pui. When do we know about the uh, Christmas numbers? Uh, when do we get that information? The majority. So the fi filers come in throughout. Um, about two months after the sales were made um, regularly. So not all businesses, um, exactly two months, it might be three months, or they might pay one month earlier. But we see majority of um, payers pay about exactly two months. So we'll have a pretty good idea of how November is coming in actually in the next um, week. We get the data about the 20th of every month. Um, Just a... Uh a note from the, the larger picture, this is a great example of the greater volatility in sales tax revenues compared to the city's other major funding sources. Uh, greater than expected revenue in May and June, and now $3 million less than expected so far this fiscal year. Sales tax is more volatile than uh, property taxes or licenses or fees, the other major revenue the city sees. Uh, should I go to the individual items? I would appreciate that council. Anyone else have any other preference for how to move through this? Ben, you're always such a good shepherd of us cats. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to jump around a little bit since the council did already adopt urgent items back in December, uh, but we're starting on A2. This is a A2, Alpha 2. <laughs> it's a request for $14,000 from American Rescue Plan Act funds that were budgeted but not used in previous fiscal years. The $14,000 is for a grant management employee in the Economic Development Department. 
there were two positions hired to manage the economic development department's grant assistance programs. These were grants to businesses and nonprofits serving local businesses. One of the employees has left. The other employee uh, is still needed to finish managing the program. It's taken longer than originally expected to implement the grants. The additional $14,000 is to pay for that position through the end of the current fiscal year. Ben, am I allowed to ask my perennial question? Why is this coming to us in a budget amendment? Why is it emergent? Uh, I defer to the administration. I, I think the hope when the annual budget was put together was that the program would be implemented faster than it actually was. But wouldn't that lend credence to why it should have been included in the last budget instead of coming to us in an amendment? So we expected this um, grant to be completed as of December. Was not completed as of December and because they only have one FTE, this $14,000 will take that FTE to the end of June for those grants to be completed through the end of June. Continuation, it's not a starting a new position. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Moving on to A5. This is a request for $3.3 million of transportation impact fees as additional funding to the 2100 South Reconstruction Project through the Sugar House Business District. It's from 700 East to 1300 East. The additional funds would maximize the eligible use of impact fees for the project. The total cost for the project has increased. This is due both to inflation and supply chain issues, but also feedback and requests from the community to have more traffic calming elements in the reconstruction. The timeline is to complete designs later this winter, and then construction could begin later this year. That's why it's in a budget amendment, so that construction can begin in the spring instead of waiting for the summer. There's a table in the staff report if you want to see the breakout of all the different funding sources, including the additional $3.3 million. It would be over $18 million for the project. The project website is 2100southslc.org. And I got an update uh, after the staff report was published. There's a proposal to add a condition to this item to keep a left-hand turn from Douglas Street onto 2100 South. And this is from Councilmember Young, who's done additional outreach to the residents who <laughs> live on this block, as well as adjacent blocks. Most of the left-hand turns along the corridor are proposed to be removed as part of this project. The majority of the residents uh, that Councilmember Young spoke to expressed support for keeping this left-hand turn onto, from Douglas Street. The Transportation Division reports that this design change would not require additional funding. They also shared that crash data shows the other left-hand turns on 2100 South have a higher number of crashes, and those left-hand turns would be removed. I don't recognize that sound. <laughs> oh. Um, if a majority, if a majority of the council supported this condition, it would be added to the motion sheet for a vote tonight. Uh, I don't know if Councilmember Young would like to add anything. Thank you. Um, I want to just quickly say thank you to all of the experts from our transportation department um, who have gone above and beyond in terms of listening to feedback from the community, making changes, relationships um, related to business needs, etc. This one particular intersection is at the very far end of the project. Um, and to quote 
the majority of the neighbors we chatted with, if they can get into their neighborhood, they want to be able to get out. And so I would uh, propose a straw poll um, to see if other council members would be interested in supporting this as part of the budget amendment three. All right. How are we feeling about this, everyone? Councilmember Young, I think you are the first person I've seen use a budget amendment to shape traffic patterns. Like, just way to go. I think that's amazing. <laughs> Why, thank you, Chair Petro. <laughs> Remarkable. All right. Sounds like we have consensus on that, Ben, if we want to move on. Okay. Next is A6, and this is very similar to the <laughs> item we just discussed. It is $3.2 million in transportation impact fees as additional funding to the 600 North and 700 North reconstruction project. That one is from Redwood Road to 800 West. This would almost maximize the eligible use of transportation impact fees. It's actually eligible for an additional 400,000, but the balance of available transportation impact fees isn't enough to cover that 400,000. So between the last item and this item, you would be fully using the transportation impact fees that the city currently has. Transportation impact fees come in, you know, every day as building permits are issued, so there will be additional revenue coming to the city. You might see a request uh, in the future for that $400,000 eligible to use those future transportation impact fees, but we just don't have the money right now to add it. The additional funds are to cover cost increases for some of the same reasons as the previous Sugar House project. A reminder that the 2022 sales tax revenue bond included almost $10 million for this project. And the council had also added almost $2 million from funding our future transit funds because there is a frequent every 15 minutes bus route that runs along 600, 700 north. The timeline is completion of the designs uh, this spring and construction is expected to begin next year. The project website is 600northslc.org. Moving on to A7, a request for $400,000 from general fund balance for security access control upgrades. This is one-time funding. It is upgrading the backend software. This same upgrade was done at the public safety building and here in city hall. This $400,000 is to do it at the justice court and Plaza 349. It also includes funding for card readers and the smart badges, sometimes called proximity cards, that you scan and use as a key. Uh, this could be discussed in a closed session since it relates to security. Next is A8, a request for $20,000 from general fund balance. This is so that the compliance division can purchase two electric trucks. They currently have funding to purchase two electric sedans. The trucks are preferred because they are better able to operate in the winter, as well as in neighborhoods with steeper terrain. Uh, and they have larger, car larger cargo space for equipment. The two trucks are to be used by the RV and long-term parking enforcement team. These are the three FTEs that were added in the last annual budget. So this 20,000 just represents the cost difference from what we had budgeted for a sedan to the truck. Correct, okay. from a electric sedan to electric trucks. Uh, that takes us to A9, a request for $200,000 from general fund balance for multimodal specialized road markings maintenance. You might remember this from CIP in the summer. The council did not fund this item in CIP. It was previously funded in CIP for a couple years. The administration is suggesting that this be an ongoing item. So in the next annual budget, there'd be $200,000 put into the base budget for the streets division in the public services department. 
The, the council suggested the administration to come back in a budget amendment because this kind of base ongoing maintenance, especially for safety purposes, better belongs in some instances in the ongoing department budgets. So it's not subject to that competitive, uncertain CIP process. The types of amenities that would be maintained include, there's over a thousand bike racks, uh, over three miles of green painted pavement. Uh, this is when bikes share the road uh, with vehicles. There are several miles of enhanced bike lanes, enhanced crosswalks, and the radar feedback signs. The departments uh, said that they'll continue to evaluate the cost of equipment and staffing to bring this in-house. Currently, we do not have the equipment to do this kind of specialized maintenance, so the funds go to contractors. Madam Chair, um, I just I do remember having this discussion during CIP, and I still feel that it's something that we should be funding every year. Maintenance of the we should buy the things that we need for our community to thrive, but we need to actually maintain those, and I don't think that we should have that in the same competitive um, allocation process as new projects or new new capital improvements. So I support um, both doing this for the fiscal year 24 budget, but also signaling that we want to see this in the fiscal year 25 budget and ongoing that that those things continue to be maintained. Thank you. I also, as a West Side resident, would love for us to not just have bike racks, but the newer technologies that actually allow us to dock our bikes and that are make them more difficult to steal because I have yet to find the lock that can't be cut through and I'm on my ninth stolen bike. If that doesn't demonstrate my commitment to not being car dependent, I don't know what does. I'll keep going to A10. This is a request for $136,000 from general fund balance for downtown parking pay station replacements. The, the blue tower parking pay stations in the downtown, they're over a decade old and they are past the recommended useful life. This is resulting in increasing maintenance costs and operational issues. The reason this is in a budget amendment is because of challenges around contracting and order and delivery windows. We've been seeing a lot of this on the capital improvement side and a lot with the vehicles. The same is true with the parking towers. The $136,000 is an initial half year payment. A seven year payment schedule is being proposed. So after this $136,000, in the fiscal year 25 to fiscal year 2030 budgets, each year would need a full year payment for a total of seven years. The city used the same seven year approach the last time the parking towers were replaced. A uh, shorter. Madam Chair, sorry. Um, a quick question on this. Um, I, um, I, I was able to travel a little bit and I, um, I've seen all sorts of different technology being used for parking management across this country and in other countries. And I, um, I wonder uh, if we are going to keep on patching on this system. And I know this was a very controversial system back in the day, and there was a lot, lot of uh, discussions about these machines and whatnot. And I know that that was a step forward. I would like more information about this as far as like how many uh, of the users are using the online uh, version versus how many are actually using the pay kiosks um, because I've been in cities now where there is no pay there are no kiosks uh, or there are fewer um, and they're relying on people uh, using their apps more which it will significant you know mean uh, less investment on those kiosks uh, and uh, improve on technology and on signage on on this. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm interested in seeing more uh, breakdown on, on um, the usage. I'm sure that we can find some of this uh, and see if there is a trend uh, of more people downloading the app as is uh, explained on those uh, things next to the parking uh, spot. Um, so maybe we can cut on some of this or maybe use the money 
and to consolidate, newer technologies. But to consolidate, like we when we went to NLC, we saw the signs that function as a historical marker and as a local map and as a directory to get you to emergency services if you need it. And also you could pay your parking through that as well. So maybe there's a more multifunctional thing that enhances the downtown experience in particular that we should invest in. Yeah, the, 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 you're, you're talking about those screens. Yeah, the touch yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The new towers are expected to have some new features. Um, I don't think these are guaranteed, uh, but the, the ones that were in the transmittal is paying by license plate, having public service information, such as events in the area, allowing businesses to sponsor parking validations, hmm. paying a parking citation at the kiosk, providing information in more languages and pollution sensors. Those are great. I would love, you know, a lot of information on this. Yeah. Okay. So we w- council member, do you want to not approve this until you is your proposal to not approve this one until we get that information or approve it with an intention in the new budget to evaluate this closer? I mean, I, I, I will hate to, uh, I, I mean, not knowing that information, uh, just, uh, you know, that I just found out about, you know, post- potential technologies, although they're not required, but if, potential maybe maybe they're not required i would like to know a little more if before i support personally i support this i want us to be looking at new technologies and seems like the administration seems to be looking that way but i before i support this i prefer to know should we strap hole where the rest of us are if this is something we want to separate out until we get more information do you want to propose a straw poll for that to- sure i i will i would like us to uh separate this one from the approval process and, and uh, uh, pending more information. Not that, you know, the information, you know, that is provided to us is uh, a deal breaker. I just want to know a little more before we allocate the money. So uh, vote in the affirmative withholds this from approval in order to gather more information. All right. So show us how you feel about that. Oh, we're unanimous. Look at us. We are so easy to please today. I'm proud of us, guys. We can right. make it complicated if you want to. <laughs> Very good at it. Council member, I, th- I thank you for this because like, I definitely, my mind didn't even go there. That's, I think this is a good amendment. All right, Ben, back to you. Uh, ben, can we do maybe like four more minutes? Because mm-hmm. if we do that, we will stay on time. Can do. Uh, A11, this is a reappropriation <laughs> for a rail spur removal. The council originally approved $205,000 in budget amendment number one last fiscal year. The funds weren't used, so they lapsed to fund balance. That's why they need to be reappropriated this fiscal year. The rail spur is at 600 West, 500 South. It was conveyed by the city in 1997. It has not been used for over a year and contractually, the city is obligated to remove it. There were previously a few of these in budget amendments. Uh, The administration stated this is believed to be the last. A 12. Why would um, something that we appropriated to CIP last year have already lapsed the fund balance? I thought there was like a five year. What I'm missing something. Uh, So the appropriation last fiscal year stayed in the general fund, which is why it lapsed. But it really is a CIP project in terms of how long it takes to get done okay. yeah to to prevent this happening again this item would also transfer it to cip so it does not lapse good great good thanks point. a you follow up with a with a question on this is this uh, related to so we're required to will you repeat that we're, <laughs> we're, we're required to to remove this uh rail spur yeah, the, the city is contractually obligated to remove it after, I believe it was two years of non-use, and that happened over a year ago. And, and who, the, this requirement, who is imposing this requirement? What, what, who is the contract with? I, I don't know off the top of my head, and I, I'd want to check with the attorney's office on what to share publicly, but we can certainly get you additional details. I'm mean, just w- wondering if this is part of the uh, some of the the goals on relating to the green loop, um, and and you know, just I want to see if that connects in, in that way at all with those projects. Um, I I don't think so because this is 600 West, and the the green loop on the west side is 500 west so this would be a block further thank you Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we got time for one more, I think. We can we can do it. The next one is A12. It's half a million dollars from unused ARPA funds, budgeted in previous fiscal years, but not used. The half million dollars is for police officer overtime related to the sanctioned campground pilot program. These would be voluntary shifts, so not all of them would go filled. The rate for overtime is $65 an hour as an incentive for the shifts to be filled. The department stated they would also utilize vacancy savings to fund additional overtime shifts as needed. The council separately has put one and a half million dollars into a holding account for potential expenses related to the temporary sanctioned campground. That one and a half million in the holding account is separate from this half million dollars of ARPA. Quick, quick question on this. I guess um, the, if I remember right, the RFP from the state to the provider was to include some questions related to uh, providing security uh, on site. And I want to know how that, you know, are we, do we really need this as a question, I guess? Um, and uh, uh, since the RFP from the state, you know, asked the provider to, to come up with a plan for security, uh, and I've been driving through the area quite a bit um and you know it seemed it seemed us uh it, maybe even so more peaceful than it than it was before um so i i'm i wonder about what is dictating the need for for this maybe there is some data that says that we need it and great to to know that um and you know uh, what are we going to do there is not the whole idea behind this site is that uh, it's a temporary in nature, and it's also there is no infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, where is the officer going to be? Is it going to be a, a you know a vehicle involved? Are it going to be just sitting there? I mean, I'm, I I would like to, to know a little more on this. Okay. So, okay. Rec- go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say for the vote tonight, uh, since we're not going to go through the remaining items. Items that have not been discussed won't be on the motion sheet for a vote, as well as the items like the parking pay station replacements that the council requested more information on. Council, are you okay with that? Are you okay giving more time to budget amendment three? We'll leave it open. And we're going to leave it open anyway for the parking thing. Just one question. I think, and on this one, we said we're looking for 500,000. But we also have 1.5 in the holding account. Can that 1.5 pay for this, or can we reduce the 1.5 by 500? I mean, the I would say the ARPA has a, a deadline to use it and spend it, whereas the one and a half million is general fund. So it's the most flexible dollars. Does not right. have a so use the deadline. ARPA for this, and then we can use the 1.5. We, if we don't need it, we can just that goes, goes back to the fund balance. That's yeah. Okay. Mary Beth or administration, are there any other things that are urgent that we should give attention to that you're waiting for? Or are we good to continue? Sorry. Um, I think the consulting for the enterprise billing system is one that I'm concerned about. I know that, um, so this is public utilities. Um, We really need to get started on that new billing system. The system is homegrown. Um, and it's old. Um, and then the other one that we already did the mill and overlay, right? Yep. The, that one was adopted. And then the grant FTE is probably another one. Either tell me if I have to work another 40 hours of so overtime or a, not. A13 and A14? <laughs> yes, please. And the council did discuss the grant FTE previously. I was, I think that one was going to be on for a vote tonight. Does any council member need further discussion on item a13 which is the grant analyst in the finance department all right and then a14 do you want to give us a a brief overview since it's our first time interacting with it so this is actually really similar to the rail spur where it's a reappropriation it was previously budgeted over a year ago it was not used lapsed to fund balance and so this is reappropriating it the um, I guess the, the, the pressing uh, timeline is Microsoft has said that they will no longer support 
this legacy software system later this year. So the consultant will look at what the options are to replace it. But the, there is that concern of it's not just going to be outdated. It's not going to get security updates. And so it creates a cybersecurity risk. Perfect. Yes, Council Member Mano. I'm sorry. I support oh. <laughs> A14. I was hoping we could touch on A16. A16. Let's go. Yeah, I was a little. I'm just. We already approved this, didn't did, we? Is this already approved or is this an additional request above what we already approved? That was approved on December 12th. Okay. okay. Yeah. And that they're not saying they need another amount for that or there's okay. not another request at this I time. got it thanks uh did we already do a15 too yep that was voted so on. this means that we're done discussing budget amendment three save for the parking uh towers the only other item is council added i1 uh, which is related to releasing funds for physical security improvements to this building um, it can be discussed during a closed session uh, the holding account had a million dollars. The it's request is for 290000 to release the funds. Council, any questions? You can also talk about it during the session. I'm fine releasing funds. Okay. Uh, I think we, like, did it. Those Way are all go. the items. Way to go, team. All right. Thank you all so much. This leads us to our next item, which is an informational <laughs> update for the state of Utah fraud risk assessment for 2023. So Mary Beth gets to stay here with us. All right, Mary Beth, the floor is yours. I tried to get away. Ben told me I could leave. <laughs> So um, every year um, with the audit, we go through um, a fraud risk assessment with the state of Utah, and then we have to present this to council. Um, shouldn't be very difficult to go through this. It's just going through and asking certain questions and whether um, we, we as a city have certain things like, um, do we have a policy on conflict of interest, procurement policies, a report for fraud, waste, and abuse, travel policies. Um, and our score was 375 out of 390. So we have a very low risk of fraud in Salt Lake City. Any questions? Thanks. Great. You're the best. Thank you. Hey, team, we've made it to our break with. We're just two minutes over. So let's give ourselves the full 20 minutes. I'll see you back at 427. 1627 for you, retired military. <laughs> We will start again with uh, the next uh, issue, which is a library budget amendment number one for fiscal year 23-24. Ben Ludke is maintaining his position at the table. We've got Mary Beth Thompson, Debbie Ehrman, Noah Basket, and Tyler Bear. Bar, sorry. <laughs> is it Bear or Bar? Dang it. So close, but so far away. All right, the time is yours. Uh, this is the first briefing for the library budget amendment number one. The public hearing is scheduled for February 6th. Uh, Debbie is uh, away, but I do want to turn the time over to Noah and Tyler since uh, they're new faces in front of the council. Well, uh, thanks to the council for having us. Uh, your, city your city library leadership is really happy to be here and grateful for the conversation to discuss uh, this budget uh, amendment number one. I wanted to take uh, just a few minutes to introduce myself to you all as your, uh, your new Salt Lake City Public uh, Library Executive Director. 
after 20 years uh, from being away from Salt Lake, I'm grateful for this opportunity to come back to serve my hometown of Salt Lake and to further uh, the mission and legacy of this 125 year institution in building a platform of equity, connection and limitless possibilities for our city. In my 20 years away from Salt Lake, I've had the opportunity to nurture collaboration on behalf of underserved and marginalized communities and cities uh, throughout the world, from everywhere from Delhi, India to Dallas, Texas. And I'm excited to bring that experience uh, back to bear on my hometown of Salt Lake and its city's libraries. I also had the chance to see four of you sworn into office a few weeks back, even before I started my job, and uh, wanted to thank you all for your service and love of this city. Uh, there were a few uh, of Mayor Mendenhall's remarks that stuck out to me in particular as they relate to library's role in our city. Uh, she said, quote, this is a moment that demands boldness, creativity, and most of all, it demands partnership. Your city library is poised uh, to meet this moment in Salt Lake with creativity and boldness and to be a nurturer of collaboration, an engine of innovation and human connection that's deeply embedded in neighborhoods throughout our city. Likewise, as I think you all agree, what Mayor Mendenhall said about professional sports is equally true about our citywide network of libraries. She said, they're about connecting. They create common ground and shared experiences. They send ripples into communities that can lift up our restaurants, bars, shops, galleries, and much, much more. Even though I'm barely a week uh, celebrating my first week as the City Library's new executive, I can tell you with certainty that our libraries really are cornerstones of connection for our city. They create foundations for our families, provide spaces for teens uh, to connect after school. They bridge the digital divide, help new businesses get off the ground, and create opportunities to practice sustainability. On top of all of this, last year, the Salt Lake City Public Library saved library users over $45 million. So with that, again, I want to thank you all for your ongoing support of the city's libraries. I've asked Tyler Barr, our director of finance, to provide a short summary of our library budget amendment number one for fiscal year 2024. Thank you, Noah. Uh, members of the council, pleasure to be with you today. Appreciate uh, this opportunity to speak with you. Um, as you may know, after the, the library's budget was initially proposed for fiscal year 24, additional property tax uh, revenue of $393,000 was identified and in included in the approved budget, increasing the general fund balance so that a budget amendment could be considered at a later date. Uh, the approved budget also included a 3% wage increase for staff, which was implemented back in August. So the amendment before you uh, includes three purposes. Um, an additional wage increase of 1% for all employees at a base cost of $112,800 plus salary related benefits of $24,840. An increase for medical insurance, which was originally estimated at 7% in the approved budget, but ultimately came in at 14.9% for that renewal. And finally, one uh, additional position for the library safety team at an estimated annual cost of $42,900 plus benefits. So this uh, proposed amendment uh, will enhance the library's ability to uh, retain and attract qualified staff and compassionately prevent and address um, and respond to safety incidents. So we appreciate your consideration of, of this amendment, uh, this proposed amendment, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Council, any questions? Council Member Pui? Madam Chair, quick, quickly a little more uh, background on the new safety. Uh, the, um, so this is a, uh, the, this are, this person will join in on a team uh, of safety personnel that the libraries have and in the uh, transmittal talks about uh, or or maybe it is a staff report talks about uh, an increase on um, criminal activity and mis misbehavior incidents um, and you know I would like to uh, know a little more about this uh, just not 
I'm, in general, I'm not obviously against this. I mean, we want to make sure the libraries are safe, and you know, that if there is a place that everybody should feel safe. Uh, uh, but I, I, I want to understand a little bit, a little bit, what is, uh, how do you define misbehave? Uh, how this is defined? Uh, I mean, even here in this building, we. Uh, subcontract some of this to, uh, you know, uh, security personnel um, uh, and that work that works around the the clock and, and this building and another uh, facility. So I, I'm, I'm interested to know a little more about what is this trend that you're seeing, uh, this unfortunate trend, and how do you define uh, this incident? And and, uh, and and second part, I guess, to this question, it is uh, a little more about. Uh, what is it that we need the security personnel versus contracting that out? Uh, and if there is any cost savings on this, or, or, or maybe there is actually benefits uh, that you can elaborate uh, or why this personnel needs to be employees of the city um, versus contracting that out. I, again, I just want to understand and not stating any policy position at, at the moment. I just want to understand what this is um, in general. So I hope that was clear enough. Great question. Thank you, Councilman. Um, and we do have a number of staff here with us as well, including Dave Corrington here in the, in the tan coat, who is our uh, safety manager. Um, but uh, to respond to your question there, violent incidents um, have increased over the last few years. Um, and this includes credible threats of violence, verbal and, and physical, um, as well as some physical alterations. Um, unfortunately, it does not appear that this is an isolated trend um, and a need that is ongoing um, to, to make sure that that uh, all patrons and all members of the community are safe in the library. Um, the the model that the, the library has followed um, and as we're building up um, is uh, focused on compassion um, and prevention. Um, some of the statistics that we've run in the last year, our social uh, services coordinator identified that 70% of these, these incidents that resulted in suspensions could have possibly been prevented um, with social service intervention. So we have um, in the past contracted with a firm for security, um, and we've found that um, um, it, 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 in addition to just responding to uh, incidents as in a reactive sense um, that we're, uh, we're seeing tremendous benefits from partnering with, with social services and safety together uh, to enhance the experience. And are there uh, location, specific locations? You, I'm sure that you track these this incidents by locations, so by different uh, uh, facilities. Uh, and um so that's interesting to me i mean it's unfortunate that we're seeing some of that and that we need some of this security but i obviously support the idea of you know more safety in our libraries and um i just uh a little curious about um what these trends are uh because they might mean that we need more in the future right and uh and and that's something that i'm interested in learning a little more yeah. thank you um, I'm curious why we have a cost of living increase. I understand medical premiums being unable to be anticipated, but a COLA adjustment seems pretty set in stone, and we're not seeing it anywhere else throughout the city indicating something wonky happened here. So why are we being asked for a COLA in the middle of the year? Um, the, as you may know, the, the library is almost exclusively dependent on property taxes, source <laughs> of revenue. Uh, unlike other city departments, there were, there's, there are other sources there that go into that. Um, so the practice has been over the last few years, um, identifying conservatively what, uh, the budget can afford. And then if there are, uh, additional funds available, I'm allocating that, um, through a budget amendment later on. Um, but we would certainly agree with you as, as much as we possibly can, getting uh, any anticipated personnel costs in the budget up front is, is uh, um, an ideal practice. I'd like us to spend some time in ensuring that we don't have mid-year COLA increases and figuring out how to avoid this in the future. I think this is related to policy question number three in the staff report. There wasn't a contingency with the 
library's last recommended annual budget, since you you estimate how much new growth property tax revenue you hope comes in, and then the judgment levy, and we don't find those out until June 8th. It's always that June surprise in the budget process. But if there was a contingency that came with the budget, that would give an option for the council to know what to do if there's more or less revenue than anticipated. We didn't have that this last go around, so the additional revenue that did come in went to the library's fund balance because that's kind of the default option. And that's the revenue that's proposed to be used to pay for these two items before you. I know you all have kind of been in an ad hoc putting it together with interim leadership. So Mr. Basket, if there's any resources you need it in preparation for the budget year so that these sorts of things can be foreseen, I would really be interested in investing in those resources to make sure you're successful. Thank you, council member. Really appreciate that. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I, sorry if I missed this, but does um, does the library have a 35% cap like cities fund balance does? Does not. So this money could, this a, this amount that was over the annual budget's um, anticipated revenues could just be kept in library fund balance until next fiscal year. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, Council Member Young. I just had one other question related to the FTE component. So I noted that you're going to be piloting the mobile patrol model. I'm just curious what type of outcome measures you're looking to use to determine the success of that effort. Great question. Um, if I could ask Dave to, to uh, join us up here. Um, currently, uh, the, the mobile function um, is, is um, handled by one uh, position. And the idea here uh, is that, that we'd be able to um, split into two different positions and cover the city um, with quicker response times for, as needed. Um, so as far as um, uh, outcomes, um, certainly reduced incidents, I think, is one, but I'll let Dave speak to, to that. So uh, just uh, some context on your question as well before when we were uh, contract security before we brought everything in house, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, challenges, I think, with that, a lot of um, issues in terms of, you know, de-escalation and, and not having a lot of control over some of the in-house stuff they were trying to do. So I was brought in, I've uh, been here for about three years. Uh, we have created uh, a in-house security operations center, a dispatch that ma manages and monitors all of our radio traffic, monitors all of our video. Uh, currently, we've got about 160 video cameras throughout all eight branches in the main library. The mobile patrol, one of the big gaps that I found was at our branches. And they are kind of like these isolated islands out there, and they do get a lot of problematic issues we get violence, we see drug use, uh, prostitution, a uh, lot of aggression that occurs out there. So the idea behind the mobile patrol, uh, currently the model is, is that we have one mobile patrol vehicle. The mobile patrol goes from branch to branch. Uh, we've also in incorporated a citywide radio system. So we're able to contact them to respond much quicker than before we were having to leave the main library. So phase two of that is really bringing in a second mobile patrol that's gonna be able to do one on four branches and then a second on the other four branches. So we have, uh, we have more uh, visibility and capability of a security safety presence and then a quicker response time to deal with some of the challenges that we're seeing out there right now. Great. I would be interested in just how that additional FTE ultimately impacts, you know, the ability to whether it is incidents that they're able to engage in, um, additional supports, just to kind of understand, I think, to council member police point. Point. Um, I'm sure there's certain branches that may see, you know, more of those incidents than others and just how we can target those specific resources it, once it's through pilot period. Yeah. So having that extra FTE is basically going to give us that additional resource uh, to be able to have what I would consider a lot better coverage of the city library branches. Uh, as well as we kind of have a, a hybrid approach where some of our mobile patrols are also cross-trained to be dispatchers. And so having that capability to have the full coverage of the dispatch, uh, some of the programs that 
we've implemented are uh, trying to be a lot more proactive. So we've implemented halo sensors in our public restrooms. They alert us if there's vaping, if somebody's lying on the ground, if they're screaming. And then so having that FTE uh, will allow us, you know, to be able to uh, really just we're just seeing I think you I, you probably shared some of the uh, statistics. I don't know if you saw that, but last year we were, you know, right around 400 and I believe 10 incidents this year, you know, we're way up to six something and we're seeing a lot of violence. We're seeing an increase in drug use. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, an increase in mental illness, which then can trickle out to some of the behaviors. And that's what's been so critical for us in partnering with our social services in-house is that we're able to utilize some of that. So really, it's just we are stretched a little thin right now. And uh, I was concerned about the safety of my own team and making sure that we have the proper uh, backing and the resources to make sure that we stay safe as well. So hopefully that answers that question. It does. So I've I've just seen um, sometimes there is a desire to say um, have an equitable distribution, you know, in terms of, well, these four branches get one person and these four get another. Um, The model I've seen is specific to school resource officers um, and that although I think it's very well intended, um, if the (coughs) schools you're assigned or elementary schools that, you know, very rarely see kind of high high violent uh, incidents you're like well is that resource really going to the greatest need where you then have other schools whose you know single person is being split and they're not able to address the issues at hand um so i just appreciate the attention to where's the need and even if that need means okay well one person is assigned to five branches but another unit is only assigned to these three to be able to make sure that there's somebody available to support the staff um that's what i'm interested in Got it. Yes. And we do have that, uh, for example, Glendale, the after school, they can see up to 150 kids in their branch. And you can imagine having that. So we were able to deploy, you know, one of these mobile patrols to be there full time during that three to four hour period during the school year. But then that takes away from some of the others. So having this second component to be able to redeploy, identify where the needs are, that that's exactly what the strategy and model is. All right, Council Member Wharton, then Council Member Pui, and then we need to move on. All right. Um, thank you, Noah. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, and I appreciate everything you said about libraries um, in your remarks, and I, I agree with you. I think that's all true. Um, but I am concerned about there's been some issues that came up over the last year with the library um, and with with financing and so I don't um, like the fact the answer that we didn't budget for a, a, a contingency for COLA is concerning to me because that is my understanding that you typically would budget for that so I don't understand why that not you the library didn't do that this time um, and then I also wonder why, um, if this is a budget amendment that's mid-year, um, why the proposal is for a full year. Um, no, this is for, um, yeah, for the new associate. Or, yeah, sorry, for the new associate. Yeah. Um, so the this amendment that you're considering now actually um, originated um, a number of months ago prior to uh, Noah and Mike coming on the scene. Um, and so we had anticipated um, it coming to the council much sooner, not knowing exactly the, implement, the timing of implementation. That's why um, we included the full year to make sure, of course, that uh, future years are, are uh, funded sufficiently as well. Um, and did you have a question with regard to the why wasn't that contingency plan for why was it not yeah for cola when it typically would be um i was not involved in the the uh, yeah. development of the budget there um right. but the information that we have had, had uh, uh indicated that there were was not anticipation of funds um as much as came in um through property tax 
when the budget was in initially mm -hmm. proposed uh, about a year ago, um, <laughs> then uh, as Ben indicated, waiting until June to find out the um, the actual amounts that would come in. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't time, it was my understanding, to, to adjust the budget there. And a contingency is what would have given us the flexibility to be responsible those numbers. So the contingency seems like a pretty standard operating procedure for budgets, especially in organizations our side, especially in municipalities that are dependent upon others. So is there a strategy in place now to make sure that a contingency happens or is there additional insight, help, resourcing needed to ensure that we get one this year? Yeah. Uh, contingency contingency is being contemplated. Um, staff is meeting with, uh, with uh, managers uh, as we speak and prioritizing requests and so out of those priorities uh, naturally will come contingency that uh, if we can get down to five notches on the list mm -hmm. um, that's where we're at and then here are the next five if there's additional funding so absolutely council member please oh it's just gonna, that i i know it's hard to answer for <clears throat> these things that happened in the past i just and the reason i'm raising these questions is i don't want to like seem like I'm uh, I don't want to be a jerk um, but I because I believe very much in what you said um, about the importance of libraries like how critical it is that we're sure about these budget decisions um, that are happening because um, when uh, when you have a resource that is so critical especially to, to residents that that rely on it maybe disproportionately more than other residents you know if we're making mistakes that result in staff layoffs or library closures or whatever it it it's gonna hurt them the most um so i'm not i, I don't do it to try to be like answer for things that happened when you weren't here but to really underscore all of those things that you said yeah, very much appreciate the feedback from uh, council members, and we uh, we take fiscal uh, stewardship very, very seriously. I don't think Tyler uh, had the chance to mention in his introduction that he did start uh, with the library in November as well, and uh, is leading a ph phenomenal team and phenomenal budgeting process. So uh, feedback received, and thank you so much. Thanks. And, uh, very, very quickly, I you know, and I I want to amplify some of the the. the the, the comments from Councilmember Wharton um, as, as far as some of the budgeting issues and, uh, and you know, want to make sure that that is underscored um, because uh, they were very frustrating, um, uh, to say the least, uh, you know, in the past. And but, but just uh, on that graph of uh, incidents, it was very shocking to see that. That graph was, uh, you know, and it's unfortunate to see that gigantic jump on, on incidents. And I, um, I I would like to know more information about this. And I hope that, you know, maybe there is a regular reporting to, uh, to, to us because the libraries are a key service that we provide. They are also the image of Salt Lake City. The last thing we, I will want, and I'm sure that this sentiment is shared, that, that this keeps amplifying uh keeps growing and and uh maybe there is something else to be done uh i just would like some regular reporting on this since it's that shocking and that um that bad that red that you know all of those columns uh, but you know certainly that violent uh you know issues of safety are growing so i i will hope that we can get some regular reporting on for sure. Yeah, thank you for your care and concern, and we can work with the safety team to to provide that uh, ongoing reporting. Yeah, yeah, and some metrics, right? That you we can all track that there are maybe yeah. standard in, in the police department that can help us measure with some level of consistency uh, how you define things, making sure that they match in some way or shape or form with other metrics that the police department can be using to to understand. So some some coordination there as far as the metrics. Maybe you know, maybe there uh, to start to, so, so there's some standard perfection. Yeah. Thank you. You survived your first firing <laughs> squad, so thank you. We look oh, forward. you all made it easy. Yeah, thank you all for having. Yeah, me. we look forward to having you back soon. Um, apologies to our Central Wasatch friends. We are going to let our legislative update briefing go, just because during the session, our legislative teams. Uh, schedule is inflexible, so I'd like to welcome up Kate Bradshaw and uh, Angela Price for the first time this session. Look at them. They look well rested now. Remember what this looks like. It'll get less and less every week. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you guys so much for allowing us to have time on the agenda this evening. I'm Angela Price, the Legislative Affairs Director. And I am Kate Bradshaw, one of your lobby team members. Um, so we want to just give a high level summary of some of the bills that uh, we are working on and tracking for the city. First, I want to extend some gratitude to our lobby team. They have already hit the ground running and we've only been in session a few hours here today. And special thanks to Dave Spadafore, who is starting his 50th legislative session today. So I uh, just want to give give our gratitude to our lobby team and to Dave Spadafore for all his work over the past 50 years. <laughs> so a uh, pretty remarkable um, legacy that he's leaving here in Utah. We have five policy priorities that you guys have established, um, both as the city council and in conjunction with the mayor. Um, the first, is, I, I joke that it's probably the first and the like one millionth um, is homelessness. And so um, we have several bills that have dropped in the homelessness category. I'll just call out two specifically this evening. The first is HB 298, Homeless Services Amendments. And this bill does a whole lot of things. Um, it changes the homeless council structure. It changes proximity requirements. It changes code blue. Um, and then HB 207 is the Utah Homeless Council Amendments. Um, also changes the structure of the homeless um, council and does some other things. We, Sorry, what was the change to code blue? Is it changing the, the triggering? Yes. Mm -hmm. To what? Currently, the standard is has to be at the temperature requirements 15. for two hours. It would be for four. Oh, same degree, but longer duration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> just know that um, there's a whole suite of bills that will be coming in the homelessness um, category that tie to the governor's um, homelessness initiatives that he released with his budget. There's been some mental and behavioral health bills. Um, so we're tracking these really closely. These um, are new. They just dropped yesterday. So we're working with the mayor's office on analyzing these bills and understanding. I think we almost um, need a huge matrix of all of the moving pieces and, and what impacts the city. And so know that we're going to be working on building um, building that up. Housing is another category for the for us that we're watching really closely. Just this afternoon, um, we had HB 306, Residential Housing Amendments, which has a land use preemption for um, starter homes. Again, this is tied to Governor Cox's housing innovation budget proposal that he rolled out um, in mid-December. And this bill um, basically preempts cities on our ability to um, allow for starter homes, meaning that any starter home proposal that is eight units to the acre is a permitted use. And it also limits our ability to collect impact fees on those um, starter homes. So we'll be working closely with that. You've probably heard this proposal um, in the Utah League of Cities and Towns is, have been discussing this as well. So this is one of the, um, what I'm trying to think of the word that Cam uses, um, Rumblings, rumbling one has been dropped. So we will be watching this closely. Um, the other categories are energy, water, and the environment. And um, we have several bills there um, that specifically our public utility team is watching um, and working on. Um, one is Representative Snyder's bill that we just met on this afternoon um, and just understanding the impacts that that may have on, on our water supply here and our ability um, to provide water to our residents. Um, there's been a lot of energy bills that have dropped and we've been watching those closely. A lot of them are just restructuring, um, but we will continue to um, pull those bills and understand how they will impact the city along with any sustainability initiatives. Um, local control was kind of the fourth policy pillar um, under local control. Obviously, we want to, um, we're seeing a lot of um, 
I don't, what's the the word I want to use here? We're seeing a lot of bills that um, could compromise our local control in a whole lot of different areas. So we're flagging all of those, um, asking our departments to review them, understanding how they really impact the city, and then we'll be bringing those priorities to you. And then the last is transportation. Um, and within transportation, of course, we have active transportation and, and railroad. And, and so we are still in, in the I-15 expansion. So we're still waiting for those bills to come. We'll get a big um, briefing this week on the transportation bills and the initiatives that will be coming during the session. So happy to share that with you guys next week. Anything you want to add on the top five, Kate, before we go into some other bills? Um, because you and I are rubbing off on each other, I also <laughs> want to start with gratitude. Um, and uh, gratitude in particular to Cindy Liu and her amazing team on the new tracking system. It's not new. They, they have refined their tracking system. And the reason why that is critically important is um, the legislature has more bill file requests by far than they've ever had before. Um, 1,400 bills have been requested so far this year. It is, it is uh, trouncing any other records they've ever set for requests. And they've also right now one day Hi, that's what i want to say it's terrifying <laughs> yeah one day into the session um they have already released 424 Holy numbered God. bills which is also um a record for any week one let alone day one and so uh the gratitude for the new system i have already been through sifting the bills that have dropped today the new system is fantastic thank you for dedicating the resources to help the team do that See, we are going to become one we by are. the end. <laughs> We've been joking how we're going to just morph into this entity. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if 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 I adopt crystals or if, um, <laughs> if I'm able to move her into puffy vest. <laughs> Again, the sequential pictures might be really fascinating for you guys. <laughs> You're a sitcom waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> With, with that, though, I think, you know, the lobby team, obviously, we've hit the ground running because of just the en enormous number of bills coming. Meetings have already been taking place. Sifting has already been taking place. Coordination with the League of Cities and Towns and other local governments. Um, and there's already a, a robust crowd up at the state capitol. Great. Um, so we are going to just do kind of a quick hit on a couple of the bills that I know um, we've been watching closely um, here in Salt Lake, the first is HB 261 Equal Opportunity Initiatives. And um, this bill is moving very quickly. It was read in rules today and moved to the House Education Committee. So this will be um, in committee tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock. We are um, coordinating with other local governments and with the legislative subcommittee on tactics and the impacts of this bill. Um, may or may not have to Salt Lake City. So just know that we're watching this closely. Um, we are talking to other cities and understanding the impact and um, working closely with the departments within the city that um, that touch the different components of this bill to understand the breadth and depth of it. Anything else you want to add there? Um, we recognize this bill in particular um, has a lot of... Um, energy and emotion that surrounds it for obvious reasons. And so we're, um, we're very aware of that as we're working to make sure that the city's perspective is, is represented. Um, and as we work through ensuring that um, those important key components uh, continue to be presented up at the state capitol. What are other cities saying about that bill? Like, I know that maybe we maybe we're the only city that um, has a position that or more most more dedicated staff and resources. Um, but what are the other cities saying, even if they don't have dedicated staff or or whatever? Yeah, I think the cities. I, I think we're all really um, analyzing and and trying to understand the impacts of the bill and how it could um and really how it impacts the work that cities do right um and so i think that the cities that we've spoken with are still really kind of digging into how does this impact our um, hiring or how does this impact training that we do with the city? Mm -hmm. um, how does this impact any staff that they may have? And so I think everybody's still kind of 
um, doing an analysis to understand how how wide spread the impact is. Obviously, there's the um, but, you know, as Kate alluded to, just the pieces of the bill that just, you know, uh, well, don't feel. Let <laughs> don't me feel. ask it a different way. Um, among like ULCT members, uh, is this a, is this bill highly concerning to many of them or is it kind of in the middle? Is it a so, low concern? Unfortunately, the bill, um, the knowledge of the, the, the that municipalities would be included in the bill and the numbering of the bill took place after the league's last legislative policy committee last week mm -hmm. and before their their next one. So there hasn't been a formal um, discussion or vote taken uh, by the league's policy committee. Um, however, as Angela mentioned, we've we've talked with several cities that that seem like they would potentially also have offices or programs as Salt Lake City does. And so they are actively evaluating. We have um, received some of their shared analysis and have and have shared that feedback as well. I think where it kind of hits for for the vast majority of cities is the idea of local control, that you're setting up um, programs and training and offices that are um, within your purview to do to serve your constituency. And um, you know, different cities may have, you know, different programming needs based on the makeup of their population. And I think where all cities come together is that the state reaching in and directing um, how you use your resources to best serve your constituents is one of those attacks on a pillar that is um, important to um, all cities, which is which is local control. So that is probably where where we're finding the, the, the most common ground. Um, I, would say that in our discussions with other cities, um, you have the most kind of comprehensive program and office. Um, not surprising, you know, you're the city of the first class, you're the capital city, you're the biggest city. And, and so you're, um, you, the offices and programs you have are often much more expansive in all areas than, than what other smaller cities have uh, available. I obviously, when I read about this bill, uh, you know, it, it, very concerned, and 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 uh, I, I and I wanted to reiterate about, um, and I know that you know this, uh, but however we can help uh, and amplify the 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 issue and how uh, how relinquishing this. I, I think this is a big deal. I obviously I have a lot of emotions. Like I, you know, like you said, there's a lot of emotions on both sides on this issue, but I obviously have concerns about how it affects us, uh, Salt Lake City and its residents. But, uh, but also, uh, you know, the local, the issue of local control is, is key to this, uh, obviously. And that I am hoping that we can amplify as much as we can, because yeah, I, you know, it's it very much concerning to other municipalities that, you know, and the, if this is the, the this is this could be the first step on you know dictating and i remember i seen a photo yesterday when they, when they opened the session or, or it was this morning i believe it was this morning the, uh, with photos of legis legislators fighting uh, you know governmental reach federal government reach and i i hope they see the irony on on you know trying to uh, impact you know uh, the local control in our municipalities, and and um, I, I I very much concerned about this bill, and I hope I hope we can uh, amplify any voices and and reach out to other municipalities if you need need us to um, on this issue. I I uh, feel very strongly about what the precedent of this, what the set, what this sets as a precedent, obviously. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that one? <laughs> Um, <laughs> nothing like taking the air completely out of there. Um, it's a hard, it's a, it's an unfortunate one. HB 223 airport weapon possession amendments. Um, this is the, um, there's several pieces to the, this bill and, um, our team is working closely with the sponsor on, um, how this impacts the Salt Lake City Airport and um, to know that there'll be more to come there and that we're working closely um, on on that bill. 
HB 13 infrastructure financing districts. This is a bill that has revived um, this year. Representative Dunnigan is running it. Um, and um, it's building off of some two different bills from last session. And um, again, we're working closely with the league and other partners on potential guardrails um, to ensure, ensure that the local process is preserved. Um, we've been working on some internal um, policies to um, <clears throat> understand how the city um, know that we're a growing city and how we um, think about infrastructure investment, how we think about affordable housing um, development here in the city. And so we've been working on some internal policies there. Um, and then again, working with our partners on guardrails on infrastructure districts. HB 84, uh, school safety amendments. This bill um, would require um, all schools within Salt Lake. And I want to say we landed at 38. Is it 38 or 40? I just remember the dollar total yeah. of what we thought it would cost. <laughs> <laughs> um, so almost 40 schools, we'll go with that, would be impacted by this bill. Um, and essentially it would require a... Um, a safety officer and there's different categories there to be in all high school junior highs middle school or i'm um, sorry in elementary schools within the city and so um, we've been working closely with the police department and our lobby team on this bill um, obviously we support um, having a coordinated approach um, we want our schools to be safe um, we also want to think about budget implications and staffing implications on this bill and how that um, impacts our police department and so know that we're working closely um, on that and want to ensure that our schools have the best possible outcome if there certainly ever was any kind of a threat. Um, with that, th that's kind of a, a summation of the big things that we're watching right now. Kate, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I, I would just note on the airport bill, I know there had been some question about um, another bill that was filed um, during the interim, HB 56 was that bill, um, and that would have dealt with uh, Highway Patrol uh, taking over the security uh, operations for the Salt Lake Airport. We have assurances from the sponsor and from the rules chair that that bill won't move, so we are now working on this bill that we feel like has um, almost all the things in that we have agreed to. Uh, agree to on that bill and have just a few additional things we're working with on the sponsor. So, so is the bill going to be pulled? HB 56 will stay in rules, and that was the, the concerning bill. HB 223 is the bill that contains oh. our kind of uh, agreed upon path. It still needs a few more tweaks. We have a few amendments that we're actually going to be meeting with her on later tonight, uh -huh. um, but we're close. But would they pull the other bill or are they going to try and run both? No, they'll hold, they've agreed. The sponsor has agreed and the rules chair has agreed to hold the other bill in rules and not advance it. So it, it exists. Um, it's a numbered bill. But if it doesn't advance from the rules committee to a committee hearing, then its chances of making it through the session decrease every single day. I guess I'm, then why don't they just pull it, like get rid of it? The only way to do that is to make a motion to strike its enacting oh. clause. Okay. So holding it in rules is an effective way of okay. ensuring that it doesn't advance. Okay. Any okay. other questions on bills? We have lots of days to be frustrated and elated by the roller coaster that is the legislative session. So thank you, Angela and Kate, for starting us off. Oh, well, Councilmember Mono. Madam Chair, I just wanted to uh, ask Kate and Angela if I could maybe afterwards, I, I would be interested in engaging a little more on HB 306, the starter homes bill. Mm -hmm. And just um, trying to learn a little bit more about it. And I was, I did have a chance to speak, to hear the sponsor speak about it. And I, my understanding is that that bill is actually different than what the governor has proposed, even though it sounds really similar. So maybe it is, it is representative Ward's take on, on the idea. It is not, it is not, um, it is not the governor's bill, you know, Hey, Representative Ward, will you run this for me, the governor? Uh, Bill, that is not that. It is his. It is his take, his own idea on how to how to solve the problem of affordable housing, um, from his perspective. Um, uh, his Representative Ward's bill is. Um, uh, he, he has been working closely with the Realtors Association and the Property Rights Coalition. So 
on the spectrum of ideas on how one would solve this problem, this is this is the idea that comes from that side of the spectrum um, versus, for instance, ideas brought forward by um, the League of Cities and Towns or even you know more of a compromise position, the Land Use Task Force. So it sits on kind of one farther end of the uh, spectrum of how how you might tackle this this problem. Okay, and there's a lot I'd, more coming there as well. Right. I'd love, mm -hmm. I'd love to stay updated on the ones that are coming similar to that okay. or in that same vein and just I'd be able to help however I can. Yes. Councilwoman Young? You guys started with gratitude, so I just want to end with that. Um, I had the opportunity to attend one of your legislative briefings related to the Salt Lake City priorities. Kudos to you just in terms of presenting that single voice of these key issues why they're important to our city um, in a way that felt really accessible and you know easy to kind of quickly consume and understand this the city's work, especially um, our newest director. I'm just super grateful in how quickly you have stood up um, the office and the legislative efforts um, and the coordination between both of you has been truly impressive to watch. So thank you. Oh, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, we just have two other quick things to flag for you on the 29th from six to eight, there will be ice skating with the legislature, which will be really fun. Um, your families are invited, so please come and, um, this is ice skating. <laughs> Thanks to shine. Bring, bring your most sparkliest of attire. I know Kate will be in a sparkly uh, leotard because she loves. We haven't rubbed off <laughs> that much. She loves those kinds of things. And then February fourteenth, we are hosting the legislative snack break. Really excited to wrap the legislature in all of our Salt Lake City love. So um, with that, you guys know how to reach us. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. So tomorrow is local elected officials day on the Hill. So we are all invited up. I'll be up there now that I'm not in Chicago. So I hope all of you will come for at least a little bit. Additionally, in an effort not to make our um, legislative subcommittee a gatekeeping entity, or also since we have such a diverse skill set on the council, Angela and Kate have offered um, essentially an office hour during the legislative session that can function as a small group for any council people who are interested in getting information directly from them and not always filtering through us. Did you set on a time for when? Friday at three. Friday at three, and that there's a virtual and in-person option? Um, I think it will just be virtual. Just virtual? Okay, so Friday at three, if you particularly like those of us who are legislative subcommittee, please let's vacate for the other four. Um, if you want to just make sure that we don't have more than three on that call so we don't violate any OPMA. But thank you both. Go ahead. I was just gonna say we um, we made we made a virtual opportunity there because um, there will be committee hearings still going on there. So that way um, I in particular can jump from committee hearings to joining those briefings. Um, if you are brave enough to brave the parking at the state capitol, which is extra, extra bad this year, um, we do have a room reserved for the two of us to, to do those Zooms from. Yeah. And if you come up, please let us know. We would love to see warm, smiling faces. So thank you guys so much for the time this evening. You know how to reach us if you have any questions. Um, know that we will um, be in touch this evening on some of the things that are moving quickly. All right. Thank you both. Central Wasatch Commission, thank you for your patience. Hello, Council. Good evening. Okay. Um, okay. Hello. Thank you for having me. My name is Lindsay Nielsen. I am the Executive Director of the Central Wasatch Commission. I have been here many times before. It's nice to see you all in new faces. Welcome. Um, what 
the cent what the staff of the Central Wasatch Commission does every year with Salt Lake City Council is makes a visit to update you on the activities of the commission over the past year, our accomplishments, what our commissioners, including Mayor Mendenhall, who is the co-chair of the CWC and the chair of our legislative and land tenure committee have been up to. So that's what that's why I'm here. Thank you for having me. Next slide. Okay, this will be repetitive for those who have heard this pr presentation before, um, but for those who have not, the CWC is an interlocal government governmental entity. And what that means is it is composed of other local governments. We are um, a consensus driven organization focused on protecting these uh, mountains, uh, the central Wasatch in the front and in the back. We, um, yes, the, uh, the main aim of the CWC is to convene. That's the, that's our main goal. Bring together the various interest groups in these mountains, uh, to get them not only talking to each other, but coming up, like, talking to each other and ultimately arriving at, better ideas, better solutions for these ideas or for these mountains. We also exist to ultimately assist the state as the state works to address the transportation and environmental protection issues in these mountains. And we hope to assist in conflict resolution. Next slide. So these are our member jurisdictions. As I mentioned, we're an interlocal governmental or a little interlocal government entity composed of Sandy City, Salt Lake City, Summit County, Cottonwood Heights, Brighton Town, Alta Town, uh, Mill Creek, Park City, and we have ex officio members. Those are members who do not vote. Uh, those are Metro Water, UTA, and the Uinta Wasatch National or the Uinta Wasatch Cache Forest. Next slide. So why should, why are our members part of the CWC? Um, like I mentioned, we are consensus driven. It's an organization with goals really that doesn't, it's an organization that doesn't really exist elsewhere. Instead of focusing on issues in silos, all of our member jurisdictions come together uh, to one, one decision-making table to uh, approach these issues through consensus. Um, and the benefits, the, me the many benefits of uh, being a member of the CWC are, uh, as you see on your screens, a consensus-based approach to land protection issues in these mountains, a consensus-based approach to transportation issues in these mountains, uh, and then a number of uh, projects that we focus on over the years, including the Visitor Use Study, Short-Term Projects Grant Program, um, our environmental dashboard, which is an incredible font, font of in information. If you have not checked it out, I highly recommend. Um, and regional stakeholder involvement. Next slide, please. Okay, as I mentioned, one of the main goals uh, and motivating forces behind the CWC is the power to convene. Uh, we do that at the board level with all of our uh, member jurisdictions coming together at the board. We also do that through our regional stakeholder council. Our stakeholders council is a council composed of 35 members, 35 citizens. It's a citizens advisory council that includes members from various uh, interest groups in these mountains. And the idea behind the stakeholders council is um, we, the public knows these mountains if so, there is just an, an incredible amount of expertise, knowledge, and experience in these mountains, uh, and more uh, more knowledge, more heads at the table thinking over these issues are better uh, at the CWC. So that's why that's the motivating force behind convening a 35 member stakeholders council. As you can see, we have representation from 
uh, groups from uh, recreation, environment, interest groups, uh, all um, the ski resorts in the Cottonwood Canyons, uh, cultural education interests, transportation interests, recreation, and other private citizens. Next slide. New this year. Oh, I should say that uh, what happened mid-year, so this time last year when we, when the CWC came to address Salt Lake City Council, two of us were sitting here, uh, we had co-executive directors, uh, and mid-year the CWC went through a staffing restructure. It reverted back to a more traditional hierarchical staff structure with a single executive director of myself, um, a director of operations who we hired, and a community engagement coordinator. Um, this time last year, there were two co-executive directors. So that took up a, I'm sure you all know what staffing, the process of staffing is like, it takes a long time. It's a big process. In addition to uh, restructuring our staff, also new this year is a youth council. Uh, in the same way that the Stakeholders Council brings together people to one table to discuss issues in these mountains, the youth council does as well. Uh, uh, the Youth Council right now is for young people ages 16 to 30. Uh, it's about 15 people strong right now, and they are enthusiastic, uh, motivated young people. I'm so impressed all the time by them. Uh, they've self-selected into three different uh, committees, Diversity in the Outdoors, the Environmental Dashboard Education Committee, um, and the Events and Outreach Committee. And if any of you know of any young people who might have interest in joining the Youth Council, we have rolling applications. We have a little more space on this on the Youth Council. So if you have young people in mind who might be interested, you can direct them to the CWC's website or uh, direct them to me and I can give them more information. Next slide. Okay. As I mentioned uh, in previous slides, we have a short-term projects grant program. This grant program is designed to disperse funding to community groups or individuals across our study area, which includes uh, the Cottonwood Canyons, Mill Creek Canyon, and Parley's Canyon. Um, the jurisdictions along the Wasatch Front and the jurisdictions in the Wasatch Back Park City Summit County. Uh, the Projects must focus on the uh, focus areas of the CWC. Those include environmental protection, recreational stewardship, uh, the economic sustainability of these mountains, and transit and transportation in these mountains. These, what you're looking at on your screens, are the short-term projects that we funded in 2023. I should say over the four years, we started this program in 2020 and since 2020, we've dispersed just under $200,000 to short-term projects, helping community groups get their, uh, their projects that need a little bit more monetary support over the finish line or helping uh, to kickstart smaller projects uh, from the very beginning. Um, yes, yeah, so our short-term projects this year, or last year, I should say now, uh, in 2023, included things like trail maintenance work through Cottonwood Canyons Foundation, um, sh a backcountry shuttle program through Wasatch Backcountry Alliance help relieve the, tra the traffic congestion on the weekends in the canyons. Uh, Recycle Utah, the, um, that is a, a nonprofit in Park City that uh, in Recycle Utah hosts Dumpster Days events, which are events that ho helps to divert toxic waste from the landfill, helping to protect the water sources um, in these mountains, so on and so forth. This uh, short-term projects grant opens every year. We're getting ready to open the 2024 cycle in March. March 4th, that Monday, the first Monday in March is when it opens every year. So keep that in mind for your constituents. Um, the call for applications for the short-term projects grant uh, stays open for one month. And uh, this year we have in our budget $100,000 to disperse to short-term projects, to small projects this year. It's more than we've ever had. 
uh, available to disperse. So tell your constituents, okay? Well, may I uh, interrupt? Uh, maybe uh, it, it, just a little more information on this, so when I, we can amplify. Uh, if, if if you have some uh, one pagers, uh, we can share with in our newsletters and maybe share with our community councils. Um, so I will appreciate some information on this. Certainly, we can share e kits. I we generally always send out a press release, and we in. Um, in addition to the press release, we share e-kits that are easily shareable, has a link, a graphic, one paragraph, easily shareable. Awesome. Okay, next slide. Okay. Transit and transportation work. The CWC is one of the most important issues in these mountains, transit and transportation. The CWC does a lot of transit and trans transportation work in these mountains. In 2023, we released the Big Cottonwood Canyon Mobility Action Plan uh, to supplement, uh, basically to assess the needs for transit and uh, any transportation needs in that canyon specifically, in Big Cottonwood Canyon, okay? That was released in May of 2023. Uh, in addition to the BCC map, lots of acronyms in CWC's world, the BCC map, um, we, for the third year, are operating a program called the Ski Bus Bypass Program. That is a program that has been wildly successful, whereby police escort or police cars ferry the UTA ski bus from the UTA park and ride lot on Highland Drive in Sandy along its route to the park and ride lot at the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon. Okay, and what that does is that moves traffic out of the route of the ski bus and it reduces travel time upwards of 30%. It has been wildly successful and over the three years we've spent nearly $75,000 uh, to run that, to make sure that program runs. Okay, and that, that program is a partnership with UTA, of course, and Sandy City, okay? Uh, another another shuttle program, specifically the shuttle program servicing uh, backcountry and trail users in Park City, the Wasatch Back. Next slide. Yes, the environmental dashboard. It is hard. Um, it is hard for me as the executive director to pick a favorite project, a favorite pursuit at the CWC. But if I had to, it would be the environmental dashboard. Uh, if, like I said before, if you have not taken a spin around the environmental dashboard, please do. It is an incredible resource for information. If there is anything you want to know about these mountains, uh, you are like likely to be able to find that information in a fun and accessible way on the environmental dashboard. Okay, so you're seeing what you're seeing here is a screenshot of the homepage of the dashboard. Five environmental elements. This was released in 2022. It's not new, but what is new in 2023 is the addition of the human element. Okay, the human element uh, has incorporated the data that was collected through the CWC's visitor use study and has displayed it in a way, like I said, easy to read, fun to use. Okay, check it out, it's great. Next slide. And that is it. A speedy, brief presentation. Thank you for your time. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions, council members? Okay. All Thank right. you for your support. Thank you. Happy to, to be able to do this. Yeah, good to see you. Okay, um, we'll move on to item number 12, which is a board appointment. Um, Sheridan Mordew to the Business Advisory Board. Hi. Good, how are you? Come on down. Hi, I'm on video. Nope. Can you hear me? Okay, nope. sorry, I was confused. I thought you were raising your hands. <laughs> you were Sheridan. Okay, we'll take Sheridan first. You hang on. <laughs> All right. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a horrible camera here. I'm here in a hotel room in dark Atlanta. So anyway, it's actually colder here probably than Salt Lake. So consider yourselves lucky. Yes. Well, it's good to see you again. Yeah. 
Um, Excited to be here. Yeah. So if you would just um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest in serving on the business advisory board. Absolutely. Um, I think most of you have probably seen my resume. Um, I'm the owner of Hip and Humble, um, owner and founder. We've been in business for 25 years. Uh, we're at ninth and ninth. Um, we are also up in Farmington at Station Park, and we have two beautiful locations at the Salt Lake City International Airport. Um, this, let's see, I guess it was in 2022, we expanded and um, we are officially a national brand. We have a location in Fort Lauderdale, and this year we'll be opening a location in Louisville, as well as Charlotte. So we're really excited about all the growth we're experiencing right now. Um, another couple of little things. Um, I own uh, properties um, in the ninth and ninth district, um, so that's a little bit unusual. And um, uh, I am also a part of a joint venture with um, a big national company that specializes in travel retail. Um, so that's kind of everything on my resume. Um, why I want to be part of BAB is um, I think I just have a really unique uh, perspective. Um, when you kind of look at my resume and all these things I've just told you about, um, I'm very passionate about economic development. And um, when I think of what makes economic development happen, it is a beautiful combination of big businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses in all sectors working together. And when all of us are working and growing together, um, we see vibrant, really cool, wonderful neighborhoods. And that's why Ninth and Ninth exists, right? It's this really great neighborhood. People can shop. Um, people want to live there. Um, but I am just passionate about that. Um, I live in Sugar House and um, there is nothing more that I want than our downtown um, financial and tech center to be going and restaurants to be busy. I want Ninth and Ninth to be busy. I want the granary to be going off. Um, and it is the combination of all of us businesses working together. So Anyway, that excites me, and um, I'm I'm really looking forward to um, the appointment and working with you. All right, thank you so much, Sheridan. Uh, yes, start Councilmember Young. So, Sheridan, I just have to tell you, I am an avid customer of yours at Hip and Humble. Um, and one <laughs> thank of the you. things I appreciate most is the fact that you are um, a space that brings in brands that you don't see in a lot of these big box retail stores. Um, and so I'm just incredibly grateful of the fact that you use that store to elevate um, brands that aren't necessarily in the mainstream, um, but I will buy candles from you for forever. Um, so thank <laughs> you for that and for your willingness to serve the city. Oh my gosh, thank you for that wonderful comment. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And we do strive hard to really lift up smaller brands and especially women-owned brands. Um, that is really important to us, especially you know coming from myself. I know what that means to other women. So um, thank you for your support. I really, really appreciate it. Councilmember Mano. Yeah, hi Sheridan. It's really good to see you. Hi. I was really excited to see your name on this. <laughs> And I could go on and on about your store and how much <laughs> me and my kids love it. But I actually wanted to just make a comment about how um, great it's been to work with you as a constituent, as a business constituent of my district um, and work through some of the challenges with the construction and things that have been going on. And I uh, just am very excited to have you on our on this board, on this committee uh, to help not just your business, but all businesses in the city thrive. And I think that the your experiences, especially dealing with the construction that's been going on there and the changes along that yeah. corridor, um, both the challenges and the opportunities that come along with that will be really valuable on that as we as we try to um, enhance other business nodes within the city. And, and I think that's um, a, a huge value. So thank you so much for being willing to yeah. serve on the committee. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really wonderful call out. And I'd really just like to take a moment to tell you that um, 
when all the Sugar House star, um, stuff was announced, so this was probably a year, year and a half ago, and the Love and Feast, I had several um, businesses um, reach out to me and want to go to lunch, want to go get coffee to talk through how I survived and what I did. And it was awesome to, one, be called on because um, I cherish not just friendships, but acquaintances with all business owners, but to really be able to mentor them through a, an extremely difficult time for businesses was um, was a really great experience for me, actually. So um, I appreciate you calling that out and letting me elaborate on that a little bit. All right. Any other comments? All right. Great. Thank you, Sheridan. Uh, we appreciate you being here and we are very excited that you're willing to lend your skills and connections and expertise to our business advisory board. Um, we will place your um, appointment on our consent agenda for our formal mm -hmm. meeting tonight. Uh, you need not be present to win, but you are welcome. <laughs> Um, is it winning? Is it really? <laughs> uh, yes, you win the opportunity to do a lot of free work. Um, yeah, exactly. I'm excited. It's, ex it's exciting. You're going to get you in on the ground floor. You're going to love it. Um, Sounds good. So, yeah, uh, you, you don't need to be there, um, but you are welcome, of course, to join us at our meeting. Um, Wonderful. But thank you so much for your service to Salt Lake City. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a great night. Yep. Travel safe. You too. Okay. Our next, why did I do that? Our next is a board appointment to the um, business advisory board um, for Bari Allaire. Did I say that right? Oh, great. Come on down. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you're okay. I think we can confused each other. Uh, um, so, no, my, not your fault. All right. So, same question to you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest in serving on the Business Advisory Board? Oh, sorry. You need to speak into the microphone. Yeah, you're going to need to speak in the microphone. All right. Thank you. I'm going to have a heart attack in here. Yeah, I okay, get it. Now, can get you hear right me now? Yep. As I was saying, have any of you been into our consignment store found in Cap? It's in West Foothill Shopping District. What is it? Called? You have, yay. Hi. And Dan has, thank you. Sorry, what's the name of it? It's called Found and Kept. It's a consignment oh. store um, in the Foothill Shopping District. So we opened our store. We're going on our third year this April. And I have appointed myself the committee for our neighborhood. And my vision is to make it a people community. So big business, small business, all the businesses, but there's 17 businesses in our new little row. So we've all gotten together and we're naming our district. We're getting ready to um, do like a ribbon cutting, hopefully have a district member come out and do a little cut for us and have a really special. So it's a really great opportunity um, just for us to really engage with our community. We're doing really fun events doing um, pop-up sh shops, supporting local artists, and you know, um, having the sustainability be a huge part for us at Founding Cap. How can I tell you more? So here, here's the funny thing. My husband and I moved here four years ago from Huntington Beach. So we're just driving, why everyone always asks me that, because we love Salt Lake City. So we're driving around, we're going through Im Immigration Canyon, and I see a for lease sign. I'm like, that would be the coolest spot. I have a garage door, not knowing the neighborhood, not knowing where I'm going, but we go in, sign the lease organically, just make it happen. And then four or five other businesses open like a year later. So now we have Paul Paws is over there. We have a barber shop, another vintage clothing store. Every blooming thing is over there. Katie Waltman just opened a huge boutique. So all the neighbors have really been collaborating and getting together because we really want to make it a people shopping experience. I think that neighborhood is really um, needing it and thriving, and they really want to come out and do fun things. Thank you, Barry, and I thank you for uh, putting your name in the hat for the, the BAB, so appreciate that. So 
taking the leadership role in the district and the local businesses. I mean, there's 17, and you wouldn't know that there were 17, but they're all little small businesses along the 21 East, uh, just south of 13 South. Uh, and it's a wonderful little gem. Uh, and But Barry's taken the leadership role there and, and really kind of sparked the place. And so I think that on the BAB will go far, mm -hmm. especially generating the interest in, in other communities. So thank you very much for your involvement with, with the BAB. Yeah, of course. I, I, feel like, I feel like it's a missed area, just me being newer to Salt Lake. And you can tell me if I'm on the right track here. Just having Katie Waltman move into that area is huge. She's bought that entire building on the side. Her brother owns Crema right next door. So I feel like it's a, a missed opportunity. And with the help of the city and with our group that's gotten together to you know, encourage the neighborhood, and they're really into it. So I think it would be like it, it could be a ninth and ninth, but maybe going to a different direction by actually doing the registered organized community and going to the city and getting yeah. a lot of fun things to happen and keep doing events. Mr. Chair, yes. uh, I quickly I, I buy my uh, dog food in that uh, shop right there, and uh, I go all the way uh, to this area. And but I also have bought some melons and some fruits from outside the shops, uh, you know, a seasonal one. And I, I'm excited to see this area, um, you know, flourish in, in the future. So thank you for what you're doing and taking a leadership role in that community. So thank you. Oh no, of course. I know we used to have Taggy's fruit out there, but we had a little dust up, not me personally, but there was a lot of, now that new businesses are there, they were using the parking lot and some more things happened, but they might come back. Okay. I know. Great. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, as you heard, you uh, will be, your name will be placed on the uh, consent agenda at tonight's meeting that you don't need to be present, um, but you're more than welcome to join us at any of our formal meetings, as is um, any member of the public. But thank you so much for your service yeah. to Salt Lake City. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going home now. All right, sounds yeah. good. Thanks. Safe travels out there. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, next is um, an appointment to the Arts Council Board, Travis English. Is Travis here? Yeah. Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, right, sounds good. Yeah, please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you're interested in serving on the Arts Council Board. All right, yeah, I'm super excited to, to get involved. Um, so my name's Travis English. I live in the McClellan, Yale area, um, very close to 9th and 9th there. Um, <clears throat> just want to get involved with with the city. Um, in a, a, a few years ago, lived in Park City and was involved with their... Um, Arts Council, um, and I was actually the events director there. So I was very involved with the community in Park City, and I recently moved to Salt Lake about a year and a half ago. Um, have always had an interest in in events and the arts, and um, just want to get involved with the community here. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Any questions for Travis? Okay. Well, um, I don't know if you heard uh, my previous comments, but we will place yeah. your appointment um, on our consent agenda that uh, you do not need to attend the formal meeting, but um, you are welcome to if you would like. And thank you so much for your service to Salt Lake City. All right. Hey, thanks, guys. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care. Okay. Um, our next uh, appointment is uh, to the Human Rights Commission. And we have Lisa uh, Satini. Lisa is nope. Okay, we do not have Lisa with us, so um, we'll just move on to the next one, um, which is also an appointment to the Human Rights Commission with Lucia Rodriguez. Do we have Lucia here? Sorry, we don't have Lucia online. Oh. Well, that's too bad. Okay, well, um, let's see. We're like at the time that they're supposed to be here. Let's see. Um, and we don't have anything else. Why don't we go ahead and do um, any reports that we have, and then we'll circle back and see if they've shown up, and then we'll go into our closed session. Do we have any reports? Oh, dang it. I'm trying to think of something right now while I'm talking. Um, I got nothing. Okay. 
Well, one thing you could do is you could take your motion for the closed session, but specify that it will convene after you have grabbed dinner and come back um, and done your interviews. Can you do that, Katie? Well, unless they don't show up. <laughs> right. So okay. I would like to I would like to see a motion um, that to go into a closed session at uh, six o'clock. Um, and so whether you want to get dinner, go to the bathroom or whatever before that, that's when we'll convene and I'll just sit here until then if they come back. Yes. Um, what is the motion right, right here? This is the closed session. Yeah, I'd love to see a closed session motion about right. strategy dis a strategy yeah. to discuss purchase, exchange, or lease of real property and attorney client. Sorry, relation. Mr. Chair. Yeah, I believe that the closed session tonight is to advise to receive advice of counsel and to discuss security measures. Oh, well, oh. that's not what it says here. Sorry, it changed. Oh, okay. So, uh, and um, then I would love to see a motion about uh, attorney-client uh, privilege and, um, or attorney-client marriage and deployment of security devices. So moved. No. No, you have to say it. Ugh. Mr. Chair, I move that we enter into closed session for the purposes of receiving attorney advice of counsel and to discuss deployment uh, or of security devices, measures, or personnel. Second. All right. I have a motion and sec a motion from council member Mono, a second from council member Pui. Um, I have to roll call this because it's closed session. Council member Dugan. Yes. Uh, Lopez Chavez. Yes. Mono. Yes. Pui. Aye. Young. Aye. And I am an I as well. I'll see everyone at six. Uh, great. And she's, and she's back. Close session. session.